we've got to throw out this conventional wisdom. We've got to throw out the old models that we know aren't working. And not just in 2016. How many state house seats did we lose? A thousand. Governor's mansions, the House, the Senate. And we keep running the same model where we think that money is everything. And we think that connections to Wall Street and Silicon Valley and D.C. are everything. And then we step back and we say, but they think we're out of touch. What happened? Why do they think we're elitists? What happened? <laughs> It's Friday, February 9th, 2018. Welcome to another edition of Raging Chickens Out the Coop Podcast. This is Ken Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. And this week, gotta say, right off the back, fly, eagles, fly. <laughs> <laughs> On today's show, another round of government shutdown and restart, this time starring Rand Paul and Nancy Pelosi, Ryan Grimm and Lee Fang exposing the disease infecting the Democratic Party and The Intercept. The good news is that at least six progressive movement candidates just outraised the DCCC-backed establishment candidates for House races across the country. Crystal Ball from the People's House Project confirmed as much at this year's Keystone Progress Summit. You heard a little clip of her during the intro. Amazon to get into the healthcare biz. That's right. Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, and none other than Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan Chase. You know, one of the guys who helped crash our economy about a few years back. Well, they're teaming up to, uh, you know, introduce a new healthcare company with the aim of, quote, Reducing healthcare's burden on the economy while improving outcomes for employees and their families. And that's according to Bezos, only available through Amazon Prime. Trump wants a North Korea style military parade down Pennsylvania Avenue, apparently, as part of an infrastructure project. <laughs> Watching the stock market this week was fun. <laughs> Japan wants robots to care for the elderly. Yep, coming to a nursing home near you. And yes, 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 we will talk about the Eagles and Sean's appearance at the Eagles parade yesterday and the fog on Broad Street. <laughs> <laughs> Last weekend was also the Keystone Progress Summit. We were there, and we'll give you a little roundup. Lou Barletta. Yes, Lou Barletta. Always in the news. <laughs> Looks like he has locked up the alt-right vote. Can't wait to see the door knockers for that campaign. Got hoods? Sean finds out firsthand while Republicans go ape shit over gerrymandering. Chris Douche, I mean Dush, wants to impeach the PA Supreme Court. Cry, Dushy, cry. Despite GOP tears... PA will get new maps after the U.S. Supreme Court refuses to hear the PA Republicans' cry case to overturn the PA Supreme Court. Representative Dush, I mean, uh, Dush believes that the PA Supreme Court justices should have to visit Buchenwald to see the, quote, inevitable ends of violating the rule of law. Just let that sit with you for a minute, folks. <laughs> Just let that sit. <laughs> Can't make this up. Governor Wolf wants to speed up oil and gas permitting process as he takes one more shot at a decent budget. Yeah, we'll give it one more college try for the budget while we sink our planet. Way to go, Wolfie. The fight heats up over the Pashi and Kutztown University independent budget analysis that we talked about and I wrote about in Raging Chicken this past week. A group of uh, faculty, university faculty at Kutztown University, commissioned a report. Um, to conduct that independent budget analysis. Next week, Howard Bunces, the author of the report, will be on the Kutztown University's campus to discuss his findings. And Kutztown University President Kenneth Hawkinson, apparently, you know, deaf and blind to what we've been kind of pointing out for years, releases a, the sky is falling budget to faculty in an attempt to preempt Bunces' talk and apparently to double down on shock doctrine politics. In today's last call, we will talk about the Falcon Heavy launch on Tuesday. Just rewatched it with my kids last night. It's true. We will talk about the Starman and his, taking his ride in his Tesla Roadster. 
in a billion-year trip and orbiting the sun and Mars, but oops, they overshot a little bit, so it's not quite going to intersect with Mars. It's going to the asteroid belt instead. Well, there's always Ceres, right? It's kind of like Mars, except it's not. And back here on Earth, yes, good old Elon Musk decides that, uh, well, you know, at Tesla, right, you know, in his vision of the future, he said, look, no, 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 we don't need any union. We got to get rid of the union. Instead, I'm going to give you a frozen yogurt and a roller coaster. That's that's true. That's what he said. I kid you not. Oh, boy. Uh, Sean will give us more reports on the Eagles parade, right? First-hand accounts of the... Uh, only in Philly signage that was uh, circulating around. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit. I got to give a shout out, man, to the, a Woodland Farm Brewery that is up where, like, literally, like a mile or two from where I grew up um, in uh, just north of Utica, New York. Um, I opened a bottle last night of um, Oak LB Lives. Um, it's an oak barreled aged English barley wine, and I got that bottle in eight uh, August of 19, uh, 2016. And it was unbelievable. So I'm going to talk about that. Free Will announces uh, a barrel, uh, a bourbon barrel aged tap takeover for bar- for Mardi Gras. That'll be kind of cool. And we'll give you the lowdown of what's happening at Free Will. Um, Sean, maybe if he stays awake for the entire podcast, because um, he's not doing so good this morning. Uh, apparently, it's, that's due to having frost on the inside of his car windows. That really upset him this morning. So he's a little off his game. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get to that. That and so much more here on Out the Coop today. I want to remind everybody, look, I want you to tune in to the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can stream the show live at freespeech.org. You can also tune in on the Dish Network, DirecTV, or through the Free Speech TV app on Roku. And we found this out at Keystone Progress Summit, talking to Rick, that the archives of the show are finally available at freespeech.org, um, and apparently also through Roku, which is really awesome. Um, so if you missed the show, you're going to be able to get access to all the archives there, which is awesome. I want a huge shout-out to our newest members I want to thanks to Reed and Tom for joining during the, this year's Keystone Progress Summit in Harrisburg. Um, man, it's a huge, huge step up. Um, it was great hanging out with everybody out there. It was great to see we get some new members on board um, to help keep up the fight in 2018. Uh, it was great getting the feedback from everybody up there. And now we just need everybody to step up, become a member, and help support Movement Media right here at Raging Chicken Press. If you like it, what you hear, you want to support Pull No Punches Progressive Media, well, become a member for little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. And if you're not ready to become a member, no problem. You can make a one-time donation by going to RagingChickenPress.org. Click on the Support and Membership tab, and then click on Donate, and you'll be good to go. Whew. We have just a couple more weeks left in our Winter 2018 Membership Special. So if you want to join at the $10 a month level, right, we will send you Stephen Singer's new book, Gadfly on the Wall, A Public School Teacher Speaks Out on Racism and Reform. Whew. So there we have it, Sean. Sean, welcome back from Philadelphia, man. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I made sure I left like seven o'clock this morning. I'll be on the turnpike to make sure I made it here today to uh, do the podcast. <laughs> there you go. That's commitment right there, guys. That's yeah, commitment. I, <laughs> <laughs> drove home Wednesday afternoon in the rain and ice storm that we had. Uh, to go to the parade yesterday, and I was back up here uh, this morning. It was absolutely amazing. It was pretty fun. Yeah, so uh, uh, I know we'll get, we'll get to this. We'll get to all the details in the uh, in the last call today. But uh, I got it was it was incredible seeing the numbers of people out there. Um, you know, I had a bunch of students who were, uh, you know, not there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, the, it, you know, it was kind of really it was it, it was kind of really cool to see, and it was one of the best Super Bowls I've ever seen. Yeah, no, it was definitely great. Uh, you know, it. it Kind of, I'm still like kind of in a fog about the Eagles winning, you know, you know, especially like when it ended. I kind of just like looked at TV for like 20 seconds before yeah. I like reacted. And I'm just like, oh, my God, they they won. <laughs> like the game is over. They actually beat the Patriots and won the Super Bowl. So are and you I telling me that that, that 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 fog on Broad Street was basically just the fog of disbelief? That's all that was? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, there was a haze that hovered around uh hovered around the the art museum parkway the ben franklin parkway all the way up to city hall uh where i was at um not from like the fog of disbelief but people smoking pot 
tons and tons of weed was being smoked yesterday up on uh out there it well was, it is it, was, it is pretty much eagles green right <laughs> yeah <laughs> like imagine if you were in san francisco and it was about 30 40 degrees cooler out yeah, that's pretty much what it was like. It's like the right? fog uh, rolling over the mountains down. Yeah, pretty much. Like <laughs> someone posted a video of like a it's just like plume of smoke just like hovering over Logan Circle yeah. from the, from the art museum steps. And like, yeah, that's exactly what it looked like. Oh, uh, man. You know, it was. I got down there around, around like six thirty in the morning. I uh, hopped on the subway. Went to, work, went to work with my dad. He works at LaSalle University. Uh, hopped on the subway at Alney Station. And uh, took it down to Race and Vine, right where I went to high school, pretty much at Roman. And then I cut right over to the art museum. The the parkway. When I got there, there was already like ten or fifteen thousand people uh, lining up on the parkways, uh, on the parkway, getting ready for the parade. Uh, people were throwing footballs across the parkway to the other side. There's competing chants going on, <laughs> and there's a lot of great signage taken down Tom Brady. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> that's oh, not safe for work. We'll talk about yeah, that later. On. We'll get that in the last call. Well, so meanwhile, you know, uh, so that that was awesome. That was the kind of joy in these parts of the world uh, um, there. Um, and meanwhile, I mean, while, while the parade, well, go ahead. Sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say, uh, Trump should take some pointers uh, if he wants to have his own parade. Yeah, exactly. You know, take pointer <laughs> That's exactly. Today. I was going to say, somehow I think that, you know, Trump's, the, the military parade that Trump wants uh, is not going to have as much joy in it. <laughs> <Debauchery>. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be like, man, it's going to be a bunch of people with like, you know, uh, Nazi style saluting on the sidelines, uh, a bunch of uh, not hoodies, but hoods. <laughs> we'll see lining the streets of Pennsylvania Avenue um, to watch tanks roll down and tear up the, in, the tear up the roads well, in the city. Luke is going to be the person leading it up front. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. There's so much. Well, you know, let's kind of run through some of this stuff. I mean, the thing, just one, uh, you know, we're not going to get into a whole lot tonight. I mean, frankly, the, uh, today, the, the whole lot of the, you know, there was another government budget shutdown last night. Um, and then it got restarted earlier this morning, uh, early this morning at like 530 in the morning or something like this. My phone starts buzzing. Oh, agreement is reached. Um, and this is after there was some grandstanding by Rand Paul, right? He kind of like prevented a vote for a long time, making, making get to the point for a government shutdown. And Nancy Pelosi pulled the like the longest ever speech um, on the floor of the House, uh, not yesterday, I think, but the day before, um, when just to kind of like uh, make a case for the Dreamers. Um, of course, the Dreamers, you know, uh, the Democratic Party stood real strong behind the Dreamers once again for this budget shutdown by by by, uh, you know, encouraging its members or or, or or discouraging them to vote for the uh, for the for the um, for the agreement, not telling them not to just say, you know, we think it probably, you know, might not be the best idea. Um, but, you know, we're not going to ask you to do anything that would make you uncomfortable. Um, so here and it's becoming increasingly disturbing to me, at least um, to watch. Uh, the Democratic Party, um, you know, play football um, with the Dreamers. Um, it seems like more it's more about kind of scoring political points right now than it is to being connected to any strategy. Now, again, um, I, I get the fact that the Democratic Party does not have the power to, to enact this stuff um, and that it's trying to use some sort of leverage when it comes around to the, um, um, the budget talks. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to take really more than they, that. They do hold the power. Because, I mean, the Republican caucuses are so disjointed where the Democrats can just say, no, we're not going to vote for it and let it fail. No, th no that's right. They, they could play it out like that. But here, I mean, they could, strong arm the, they could strong arm the Republicans into doing that by simply saying, no, put up the votes or we're not going to vote for it. Right. And I think, we'll, look, if you're going to take your stand, you got to take your stand. Caucus. And we'll watch the Freedom Caucus, you know, split your caucus in two and then not be able to, uh, you know, put up the votes to get something done. And then when you guys can't get anything done, you'll have to come back to us and we want stuff for the dreamers. I mean, they could really strong arm their way into that, but they choose not to do that. Look, I mean, if, if you want to ask me here, the, the strategy should be this instead, right? Um, the strategy should be instead of pegging everything on the dreamers, like, like they, like they, 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 they want to claim to do, which they're actually not doing, but instead of pegging everything to the dreamers, they should come out with a litany of things about this is why we will not vote for this budget. 
We will not vote for this budget because it inc- it, it continues us down a path of destruction by cutting government ser- services, kind of destroying the public sector, and throwing all money into a military budget that is kind of out of control. We're just dis- voting against this budget because it does not include a, a kind of permanent extension of chip benefits. We're going against this budget because it's attempting to defund and take away health care from everybody. And then we're t- going against this budget because while they want to pass these kind of austerity measures to the rest of the country, right, they are selling out kind of people who have been hardworking in this country, the dreamers for all this time, right? You have this broad base of kind of, this is why we will not vote against it. So you you, you touch on the economic, um, the economic reality of most Americans, right? The things that people are most concerned about, and you include the dreamers in that list, right? So it's not everything pegged on them. And so then you have a broad base coalition to kind of build, build support behind. It's not just one thing. And then when the Republicans start freaking out, Right. About the fact that they can't even get their own caucus together to vote to vote for this. Right. Then you as Democrats, you you sit there in your negotiation and say, you know what? Uh, You know what? Maybe we can help you out there, but you're going to have to do something for us. You know, maybe we can help you out with this stuff. But look, you're not going to give us money for the uh, for uh, for free education, are you? Oh, no, no, you're not going to do that. So you're not going to give us money for free health care. Right. Matter of fact, you're attempting to defund health care. Right. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. I get it. So at the very least, you know, I want to see Republicans introduce legislation, right, supporting the Dreamers permanently, right? And then maybe we'll talk, right? There you go. And you put it back on them. Meanwhile, you're about to have this broad-based argument. So they, if you come out of that negotiations with protection for the Dreamers, that's phenomenal, right? That's what you want. In the meantime, like the way they have it now, you can't just sit there, like put it all on the dreamers and kind of polarize like in that kind of way. And then when the day after sit there and go away. No, you have to be mobilizing and kind of support for that. If that's actually what you're going to be committed uh, commitment to, because there needs to be there needs to be a solution there. Right. Um, and I think I can cons- I'm concerned that it's that it's actually working in the opposite direction in support of the dreamers by this kind of flip flopping kind of wishy washy support that they're showing uh, when it comes to these budget fights. But that's just me. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <clears throat> so you know, we talked about this a little bit at um, at at Keystone Progress Summit. Um, but you know, you you we're I, I can't remember what was the context we were talking about this in. But you know, you've you've read those pieces right by the Ryan Grimm and Lee Fong's pieces. Um, you know about the dead enders uh, in the Intercept. Yes, <clears throat> I, I think you know. I, I think it, Ryan Grimm was just on uh, was just on the majority report this week too as well, um, kind of laying out this uh, laying out this case. And man, I gotta say, um, it couldn't be more dead on, um, just in terms of unpacking the kind of structural logic that is um, um, the problem with the Democratic Party right now. I know there. Um, I mean, in Pennsylvania, we have two really good examples, or one at least. <clears throat> well, there's yeah, no, there's there's a couple of good examples with this. Um, you have dysfunction happening in the Pennsylvania Seventh uh, with Dale and Leach is where Dale and Leach is running, and Patrick Meehan's now now not running for re-election um, because of sexual harassment issues. Uh, t- t- telling a young female staffer that he's just, that he she is that they're soulmates. Um, you know he's now not running for that. Uh, there's so much dysfunction with the Republican side or Democratic side where it still appears that Dale and Leach is running, and that the Democratic Party is turning to um, a daughter of a wealthy family um i don't have her name um i believe her last name is O'Naughton. i don't know yeah, I'm just looking but for she it. is running um <clears throat> she's a former cia agent who has a big role of who has a big who has a big wealth of money um moving that this person up from dc she worked as a cia agent from her like early 20s up and through to pretty much like last year uh to run in this district yep um, which has been a strategy used by uh, Democrats in the past, in Pencil- especially in Pennsylvania. We've seen that happen with Kevin Strauss. Uh, Strauss was a former uh, CIA agent, moved up from Arlington, Virginia, to run against Fitzpatrick back in 2014. And, well, that didn't work out for him. Um, so he, but he had a, you know access to a wealth of money and so on. Um, and then also we have what's happening with uh, Jess King in Lancaster, where Jess King is the only Democratic candidate with uh, any sort of ground game with Actually, the only with any yeah, she's the only candidate with ground game, and she outraised her uh, primary opponent, um, Christina Hartman, who lost to Smucker the last time, who and actually underperformed Hillary Clinton in that right. district. Right. And the reason why Christina Hartman is running because she's access to that Rolodex. Uh, she already had the endorsement of Emily's list simply because she was there and running. 
Um, there's actually a really good uh, it's a really good story out by Ryan Grimm right now. Uh, I would recommend reading it. Actually, the funny thing is, I didn't bother reading the story until like a week after it was published, mm-hmm. and I was like looking. I was like, oh wow, this is the exact same stuff. So, funny thing is, like Ryan Grimm emailed me through Twitter. Uh, we're going back and forth for a few days talking about like the the PA seven. And pretty much, you know, everything, you know, the profile we, I gave him on what's happening down here in the Pennsylvania 7, or the the race with uh, Jess King was pretty much the profile he ran in that story, um, talking about, like, the ground game that's going on, uh, the field director, their involvement with the uh, Lancaster Stands Up, and how they are using the power of what that they built through Lancaster Stands Up over the past couple of, over the, over the past year, year and a half, mm-hmm. and implementing that into an electoral uh, political strategy. Yeah, so here's, you know, this this piece here. <clears throat> so we have we have actually there's two pieces that came out the, uh, with Ryan Grimm and Lee Fong, right? Um, about that. One is called the Dead Enders, right? Kind of lays out this kind of structural thing. The second one kind of that was a follow up to that is that about the six candidates, at least six candidates that have outrose the, uh, the comments. And I think that's the one where, where you talk to him about, right? Because here's yeah, we, uh, here's here's talking about the first couple pieces. The, oh, did one, you, oh, the first piece <clears throat> lays out the about just King and Christina Hartman. Well, here's it because just just so everyone can see this. So here's it. Here's the description of what exactly what Saunders is talking about in, in Lancaster and why people should read this article to see this as a pattern. Right. And so it's it, this is how they talk about the Just King case or, or uh, Grimm and Fong talk about it. Just King is running in Pennsylvania's gerrymandered uh, 16th district, which is currently which currently covers Lancaster, Reading and the Amish county, uh, country in between, uh, though a court last week ordered the state's congressional maps were drawn. We're going to talk about that in a bit. In the fourth quarter, she pulled in $195,000, well more than the incumbent Lloyd Smucker, whose haul was just $133,000. Christina Hartman, endorsed by Emily's List and most of the top Democrats in Pennsylvania, brought in $185,000. For all of 2017, Hartman, who ran unsuccessfully for the seat in 2016, outpaced King by $100,000, but the final quarter reflects shifting momentum. Right, And this is something, and I have to say, Sean, you have been kind of on the Jess King beat um, since she first declared that she wanted to run Um, because you know frankly because you were paying attention to what was actually happening with Lancaster stands up and what was happening on the ground in the state yeah and you know um, the people who are working on Jess King's camp uh, campaign uh, Becca Rast who's campaign manager she is John Smucker's wife Uh, John Smucker's one of the head organizers for Lancaster stands up Uh, Nick Martin's the field director he's also one of the head um, organizers for Lancaster stands up he's also been involved with uh, Lancaster against pipelines, the pipeline resistance group that formed over the past year going against the Atlantic Sunrise um, pipeline. Um, pretty much uh, his organization, the Lancaster against pipeline, is pretty much the reason why uh, Senator Scott Martin came out with legislation. Um, you know, that would force that group, Lancaster stands up, to incur any costs of demonstrate, demonstrating if arrests would be, were to be made um, during the construction process of the pipeline. So he's, you know, so it's right there. Um, Lancaster Stands Up has built this enormous ground game over the past year. And now, um, since Jess King has these two people working in managing their campaigns, um, that ground game is going to turn into something really big for uh, for Jess King. And it's, I think she's going to win, right? Simply because she has the ground game. Um, and she outraised Christina Hartman. Um, and also, you know, there's another race that's going on we haven't really paid much attention to. But uh, Greg Edwards running out of the Allentown area. Holy man, I got a, you know I got a chance to talk with Greg Edwards uh, for a while at the Keystone Progress Summit, um, and we got to see you know what can only be called like his barnstorming speech right at the very end of the Keystone Progress Summit. Man, that guy is something else. And I, I didn't I hadn't realized um, how much I know about his work already. Um, but after we got talking about it, I was very familiar with some of the work that he's been doing before. But I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. There, he's another movement candidate out of northeastern, out, out of Allentown, out, out of Allentown, Pennsylvania. Reverend, who's involved with uh, Reverend Haley Barber out of uh, North Carolina, the Moral Monday movement. He is someone else you should be watching. You know, I really, I legitimately believe that Jess King and uh, Greg Edwards have shots to getting elected to Congress, um, and they're running as unabashed progressives who are not taking really big dollar donations, and they're doing it all through small dollar donations, and they are out raising their can- their their opponents by strictly staying on that uh, Bernie Sanders model of like a $27 or $45 donation average. Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's amazing. Greg Edwards, 
um, we, as we were talking about, like, number one is like, you know, one of the things I said to him, I said, you know, so let's, you know, hopefully we're going to be able to get him on the podcast um, as an out to coop extra. Um, at the very least, we're going to be running some stories and covering that campaign much more closely because, uh, you know, just like Sean said, this is guy one, one to watch. You know, what I said to him is something that I said, you know, I've said on this show so many times is that, you know, look, Lehigh Valley is the future of Pennsylvania. Right. And his head and he like, you know, he just looked, he's like, exactly. Right. Um, and it's, and he's boom. He's like, look, this is so underrepresented. Everything that I've talked about in the show right before, um, he's like five steps ahead of me. Right. I mean, in terms of like, I'm just kind of reacting to stuff. He's been on the ground. And when so Sean, you know, talks about, uh, you know, his connections with uh, the Reverend Barber down in North Carolina. One of the things that Edwards has been doing for years now. Um, has been taking groups of um, kind of young activists right down in North Carolina um, for I think it's like a week or so um, for do kind of training and stories and background on history um, in civil disobedience in the movement. Right. Um, and this has been, you know, the back and forth um, that he's been doing this. And so he's been doing this out of the limelight for a while. So you haven't been paying attention or you've been on the ground to what's happening in uh, in Allentown. Um, well, it's you know, this is the guy that's been doing it. So there's also real close connection that he has with um, uh, Make the Road PA. Right. The Immigrants Defense Organization and the Immigrants Rights thing. Um, also, which Jess King is also connected with in Lancaster. Um, but so, you know, uh, there's been a few times that I've been out to Allentown and we covered some kind of events that are happening in Allentown. And you see this really strong turnout for immigrant communities, um, for people of color, um, for working class folks, right? And those people are turning out in part because of this network, of this mobilization, this movement network um, that is has been emerging in these sites. Now, Lancaster has been got has been getting a lot of uh, you know um, a, a, you know a, a, a lot of time in the. I don't want to say the headlines, but it's getting more attention than what's happening in Allentown. So we're definitely going to have to keep um, keep some you know some light on that. It's crazy. One of the things is also too is that, you know you mentioned you know if you look at the um, the dead enders um, article in uh, in the Intercept, uh, the Ryan Graham and Lee Fong piece that that you had talked to him about. Um, what's striking in, in this is that we saw echoes of this at the uh, at the Keystone Progress Summit when Crystal Ball was speaking. Um, but you know you had like Jess King, for example, reached out to Emily's List, right? Reached out to her and said, you know, again, um, you know, can we talk? Here's my candidacy. Here's my history of support and all that stuff. And it, it's one thing if Emily's List wants to. To, you know, endorse one candidate over the other, or decides that they don't want um, to endorse Jess King for whatever reason. They want to. They want to um, um, pick this other woman instead, Hartman instead, right? I, you know, again, that's the internal. That's their business. But the problem is, is that they would not even return her calls. Right. So Jess King um, continued to try to kind of contact them um, to get into kind of, you know, support from them or at least discussions with them. There was a leadership conference that was held down in Washington, D.C., um, being sponsored in part by Emily's List to bring women candidates down there. They invited Hartman. They did not even um, let Jess King know this thing was happening. Right. So this is part of that um, establishment uh, kind of Democratic Party structure. Now, Emily's List is not like a wing of the Democratic Party, uh, but it's associated with the same groups of people. Um, and so here's I just wanted to play this one little kind of clip of sound for um, uh, from Crystal Ball um, at the Keystone Progress Summit, which I thought was particularly striking. So we had Chris Rabb up on the stage with her, Representative Chris Rabb. You had um, 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 Larry Krasner also up on the stage. Um, and then you had a bunch of candidates or kind of prospective candidates that were in the audience that she asked actually to stand up at one point and everything. And what was remarkable, when Crystal Ball said this, you should have seen those people who wanted to run for office. They're nodding like, the, the, you know, the yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Right. Nodding at this statement. And this is this is what she said. Or can you pull up on your phone and they literally do this, pull up your contacts on your phone and show me the people who are going to give you enough money to get to a quarter of a million dollars. That's what she says. So Crystal Ball says this, right, as part of it. And she was basically talking about some of the problems that working people are facing if they want to run, right, or if they're not part of that that moneyed candidate. And she was actually, you know, you, when she said that, you had you had Krasner and Rab and the people in the audience say, yep, they did that for me. They literally did. They're like, the people say they literally do this. They ask you, unless you can show me your contacts in your phone that can get you to that amount of money, right, then we're not even going to talk to you. 
right? And we've heard this anecdotally, like, throughout the kind of years, that this is what the Democratic Party apparatus has done, right? And this is the way that they put their emphasis in their can- in, in their candidates. And this is why that piece by Ryan Grimm and Lee Fong are so important, because it unveils exactly that structural problem. But what we're seeing, the hope is, is that we're starting to see that that change where you have movement candidates that are just kind of completely out um, fundraising um, um, the establishment candidates in a number of races across the country. <clears throat> Crazy. Sean says, <clears throat> <laughs> sorry, I've been, I've been battling a uh, sinus over the past couple of days. Sinus cold. So. That's what the kids are calling it these days, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, there's that. I mean, there's also a bunch of other issues that are going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we could talk about the I've, I, I, I guess we could save it for the second part, but you know we're, we have these three movement candidates running here in Pennsylvania. We've got the chance to interview them: uh, Elizabeth Fiedler, J- Sarah Namrado, and um, Summer Lee. We had a really good interview with them. But while they had their panel, um, there's a lady Emily Sopkoff, I believe, or Skopoff. Her name. She's running against Mike Terzai. Right. right. She has no shot at winning. She's a movement. She's she's an activist candidate running against Mike Terzai, and she was spotted at Sarah Namrado's. Um, at Sarah and Murado's, um campaign kickoff, right? Mm-hmm. And she got scolded by Democratic leaders from that part of the state simply for showing up to her campaign kickoff. Yeah, well, you know, I, mean, I, I have to say that we see here in Pennsylvania, too. Yep. And I have to say this, and you know, again, like Sean's right, we're going to get into some of the details there. We were actually kind of went to uh, the fundraiser for some movement candidates. And we're going to talk about that um, in, in the second segment. Um, but, you know, w- one of the things I have to say is I, I just personally, right, the one aspect um, that I've always I, I, I don't know, I, I feel I just not very good at it, you know, unless I'm I thought unless I'm doing it with somebody who um, who's really who's really skilled at doing this. Um, I think this was also true when I was doing uh, union organizing. Um, when I was trying to do this stuff on my own, I, I felt like I just was not as skilled at doing this. Um, but, you know, good kind of door to door door knocking stuff. Right. Um, I think I'm, I, I work really well if there's somebody else who takes the lead on that. And then, you know, uh, I'm there to kind of putting up points to as well um, for, for whatever reason about my makeup. But um, this I have to say the way that the, uh, the DCCC and the Pennsylvania Democratic Party um, are are treating movement candidates right now. Um, this is the first time in a long time um, that I've been motivated to actually kind of want to get to these folks and kind of show up and do some door knocking. Um, because in part because it, in my mind this is an easy sell. <laughs> these folks are kind of looking out for the best interests of people in their community. They've got the right message. They've got the right policies. They got the right energy. And you've got a Democratic Party apparatus which is standing in their way. So crazy. But we'll get to a bunch of the stuff in Pennsylvania. So I want to touch on a couple other things before we go to break. Um, one of the kind of developments for this week that was, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the neutral interesting, was the fact that Amazon, um, <laughs> Amazon and uh, Jeff Bezos, basically Warren Buffett and Jamie Dimon, right, um, are going to be teaming up um, to basically disrupt the healthcare industry. Um, as they talk about it. Now, you know, the official line from Bezos is basically, look, uh, we're going to be about reducing healthcare's burden on the economy while improving outcomes for employees and their families. Um, some of the, what's really, it's going to be very, very interesting to watch what's going on. Now, what, what the plan is at this point are for these three, um, these three to, um, to, to team up. So, okay, you've got Amazon. Obviously, we know what Amazon is. Warren Buffett is the head of Berkshire something or other like this, right, this big financial firm. Um, and then Jamie Dimon is from J.P. Morgan Chase. OK, so what they're looking for is establishing their own health care system first for their employees. Right? And their claims are that the um, health care industry has gotten so, um, so costly and so out of whack that it needs to kind of they're going to take this over or they're going to basically show the rest of us how it's done, basically, by reducing cost and kind of increasing the quality of what they're what they're going to be delivering. That's the claim, at least. So this is going to be very important to watch in part because um, what they call disruption means that um, they're going to get into a, a particular industry and attempt to fundamentally alter and transform the way that industry operates. Now, I think all of us would agree that um, the healthcare industry operates horribly right now does not serve the vast majority of people. Right? It's about getting, you know, insurance companies getting big payouts. Um, it's about denying people care as opposed to delivering people care I and mean, ensuring people have care. Um, 
And the, the uh, with this announcement, there was additional reporting that came in. So I don't know if you, anybody followed this, but um, CVS, um, oh God, I'm going to forget right now. They're just looking to merge with. Um, did you see this at all, Sean? This. Um, Oh, God, let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah, CVS and Aetna, right? CVS and Aetna um, basically um, decided, decided they're going to have a merger, right? Um, and that was, uh, again, back back reporting was, um, or kind of behind the scenes reporting was, the reason, one of the reasons that drove these two um, to kind of move forward with this merger uh, was, was in part because Amazon was making a strong push to start selling prescription drugs. OK, and so that so what CVS and Aetna did just because of, for their own self-interest they say we're going to need to get bigger in order to compete with Amazon. That gives you a little sense of what what they mean by disruption. So let, let's play this out a little bit. So on the one hand, let's say that Amazon moves forward. Now, what has their model been? Right. Their model has been to kind of like, you know, lower the cost of labor. <laughs> right. Um, kind of distribute out kind of a wide network of, of kind of lower paid individuals through like, you know, Amazon's got this warehousing and things like this. They've already got a warehousing system set up for prescription drugs. Right. You can, too, can get your reduced prescription drugs by joining Amazon Prime. Right. I mean, we could see that happening. Um, and but we can also say that are they looking at, say, deprofessionalizing? Like, in other words, are they looking at kind of like reducing the number of doctors, right, and increasing the number of nurses, right? Now, again, that's not necessarily a horrible thing, right, um, in terms of kind of making sure that you have nursing staff um, that are um, – um, that are, are available, especially when you're talking about everyday care and stuff, right? But what is it going to look like to have a pressure down at doctors? Now, again, there's highly paid specialists that are getting insane amounts of money, and that needs to come down. There's no doubt about it. Um, but what's that going to look like? So that's a good big question. Is Amazon going to start its own nursing school, for example, right? That would actually start training nurses to deliver healthcare in the way that Amazon wants. We don't know, but we certainly see the way that they've affected other industries. So it's going to be something to watch. My biggest concern has not to do so much with some of that disruptive stuff, but to what degree does this take energy away from a move towards single payer, right? Because what Amazon and what, what they've hinted at in some of the reporting on this, what Amazon, um, what Bezos, um, Buffett, and uh, Jamie Dimon have mostly hinted at is like they want to work on their own employees first in order to then kind of extend it to the rest of the folks. So we, we have the, the potential emergence of a, a competing model with single payer. Right? And everyone has shown that single payer um, is the way to go. And I think that's where our energies need to be. Um, my concern is that, you know, progressives sometimes can get uh, a little glitzy about looking at, you know, uh, the high tech folks like uh, the Amazon people, Jeff Bezos people and that kind of stuff uh, as a, uh, you know, as a solution. And I hope we don't go that route. So, yeah, I haven't been paying much attention to it. <laughs> I know it's it's. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's definitely interesting. I haven't been reading much on this, but I mean, it's it's going to be. I, I thought they were doing it from the, the point of self insurance of their own because of how high risk um, their factories are and how much um, you know how it's a lot more harder to insure people through a, like an insurance agency or not insurance agency, but through like a healthcare agency because of the incidents that happen within within Amazon plants and how like hardly they ran. Mm -hmm. That's where I thought this was going to come out of uh, more towards that. I think that's like part of more it. of a self insurance policy. Well, I think that's part of it. Um, but I think the way that they've been, t the way that Bezos has been talking about this as kind of a disruptive, um, like, like overtly talking about it as kind of to disrupt the industry. Um, there, it's much bigger than that, right? So the self insurance part of it, like you know, again, Bezos has a history of thinking big and long term, right? Even when he doesn't personally have the skills to kind of actually execute this stuff, right? Um, like, in other words, he's not a healthcare professional, right? <laughs> he's not a healthcare expert, but he thinks structurally, right? And he knows it's about scale. So one thing's that, and the fact that you've got Buffett, you've got the finance industry, right? And Wall Street in on the same mix, um, that should set, be setting alarm bells, like off for all of us in terms of what, what is potential down the road. So I don't know. We shall see. Um, and, you know, and, and to what degree, what does that mean? You know, I started thinking about, well, the warehouses, what does that mean if you're actually now selling, now you got, you're running prescription drugs through Amazon warehouses, right? And the shipments are going to be sent off by poorly, play, poorly paid, overworked um, um, workers in your warehouse, right? So what, do you, what happens when you're putting opioids in their hands in order to distribute that stuff? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I start thinking, 
there, there's a whole bunch of issues that um, uh, that that could be potential problems here. So I just want to put that on people's radar um, at this point, rather than kind of you know, so we know the direction it's going. We don't, um, but we're going to see this stuff to start to unfold in the coming weeks. So um, at least it ha- has my attention, I should say. Um, that's crazy. And so, like, uh, I, I, on the other side of it, right, you've got in Japan, this is going to be the other thing. That's got, Japan is basically making a huge initiative to start deploying robots, right, for elder care. Right? And it's not just in elder care, um, but um, that is one of the places that they want to have um, deploying these robots. And Japan, of course, has been kind of technological cutting edge on, on, on so many fronts. Um, and they actually have these these robots that they've been testing and they're starting to roll out as a way to kind of ensure that um, folks in nursing homes and things like this always have someone to talk to, right, or engage with and things like this. Um, and they're making the push right now, like and the Japanese government is also investing in this big time, um, making the push right now to begin hitting the market um, for kind of robots and healthcare and a variety of other service industries. So if you're starting talking about, you know, um, we've been seeing kind of technologies starting to displace workers. There's been big concerns about, you know, in, let's say, the fast food industry and other service sectors where they're looking to completely automize, um, automatize, or however you want to talk about, automate um, the uh, fast food industries, right? And by deploying even robots and that kind of stuff within the fast food industries, um, now we're starting to see in kind of more skilled um, um, uh, service sector jobs too as well. So again, boom, put that one on your radar too, folks. Um, that's another kind of line I think that we're going to be paying attention to in this coming year. Um, so it seems like this seems to be a big, uh, one of these big fronts moving forward. So um, last thing before the break, though, Sean, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but like, uh, man, there was some riveting TV this week. Um, it was it was like uh, every it seemed like every kind of news channel you pulled on and um, even like the evening news. You got to see this kind of like, um, you know, it was really like this kind of cool, like like cross media, trans media uh, a, a kind of like drama that it's been unfolding. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, no, I do not. <clears throat> Dude, the stock market, man, it's been freaking great. <laughs> the drama, Sean, the drama, <laughs> the ups, no, the downs, the, the crashes, market. the falls. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been remarkable. So, you know, this, uh, like the Dow, we see the Dow Jones, the stock market has lost like thousands of points uh, since last week. My favorite piece of it, too, as well, was that last Friday, right, when the first big, huge drop happened, it dropped by Mark of the Beast, 666 points. <laughs> Right. That was Friday. And then it took another thousand a uh, thousand point drop on Monday, kind of rebound a little another thousand point drop on Wednesday or Thursday, whatever it was. So it keeps on hitting these huge drops. And, you know, frankly, um, what's interesting about this, right, is that um, it's getting all sorts of media coverage, um, both online, both uh, kind of cable news and evening news and all that. But as we know, that this, that impacts fewer and fewer um, people in our country, right? Um, there was a time which all – well, no, it still is the case – that uh, it's as if the, the news reports on the stock market as if the stock market was the economy, right? So we're seeing these ups and downs. And I, I couldn't help think about this. Like, wow, this is like celebrity culture in our country as a whole, right? We're watching the stock market. We're seeing people really concerned and, oh, my God, another thousand point drop. And, you know, experts are talking about this and this drama is unfolding. But the drama is unfolding for people – who are not us, right? We have only, you know, most of us have only marginal interest in the stock market. Maybe we have a small, like some of our pension stuff, if there, we even have a pension anymore, is connected to this. Um, who that matters to are the people at the very top of the income ladder, right? Yet we're asked to watch the stock market as and asked to be concerned about it. It's like we're asked to be concerned about what happened to Britney Spears or, you know, or, or Taylor Swift's latest, you know, celebrity drama, right? We're kind of like asked to watch these other people's lives and the concerns of the other people's lives and ask and that's to kind of have input as if it were our own and it's not. So it's very interesting, right? On the one hand, right? Okay. You know, stock market's up and down and all that kind of stuff, right? I personally, I'm going to be partially affected by this because, you know, I have, you know, how when I'm going to retire is going to be based on my shitty, like, like whatever TIA craft, right? And that's what I'm going to get in the end. Uh, and TIA craft is one of the better ones of these, like, you know, stock market enhanced, like whatever retirement things, but whatever. So it's going to have a, it's going to have a hit for anybody who's got that kind of thing. But overall you're talking about, you know, the top 1%, 2% of people um, for that actually matters to. So 
There you go, folks. Not our economy is all I got to say. Not our economy. I would love to see that kind of same kind of attention being paid to the economy for the rest of us. Right. What would the charts and graphs look like for our economy, not their economy? But anyways, uh, well, so, Sean, I think we should take a break. What do you say? Sounds good. All right. Sean needs a nap. So we're off to take a break and we'll be back right after this. This is Kevin Mahoney, Raging Chicken Radio. Woo! <laughs> I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1937. That was the day Sheriff Theodore Middleton and his deputies in Harlan County shot into the house of UMWA organizer Marshall Music, killing his 15-year-old son, Bennett. Music organized for the UMWA's District 19. He traveled all over Harlan County. As a district organizer, he was beaten, arrested, and evicted from company housing repeatedly. Some of the mines were organized in Harlan County, but barely. Many coal operators controlled area sheriff's departments and restricted the daily life of miners and their union representatives. Organizing drives started in January of 1937. Union men faced extreme physical violence. Organizers were tear gassed in early January. Their cars were dynamited later that month. Music and his wife were shot at and warned repeatedly to leave town. Another organizer had his door busted down by deputies and his house ransacked. Music finally agreed to leave town to keep his family safe. But on this day, upon arriving in Pineville, he learned his son had been killed in a firestorm of bullets shot into his house. On March 22nd, the La Follette Committee on Civil Liberties opened hearings into Bloody Harlan. It lasted for six weeks. The Justice Department indicted 69 Harlan County coal operators and law officers for criminal conspiracy in violation of the Wagner Act. Meanwhile, the new National Labor Relations Board answered the UMWA charges and found in the union's favor. The board issued a cease and desist order against interference with union activity and ordered the reinstatement of 60 coal miners. As a result, union membership soared to 9,000. The UMWA would continue for decades to fight to keep Harlan County organized. Welcome back to Raging Chicken's Out the Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press, and I'm here once again, as always, with Sean Kitchen, our muckraker-in-chief. Uh, so, Sean, um, you know, we've got some, uh, you know, the, the, I guess I guess the nut parade continues in Pennsylvania. I don't know what else to say about it. Yep, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the last time we did a podcast that wasn't from the Keystone Progress Summit, um, we, we talked about Lou Barletta and some of his connections. A report came out from CNN, his connections with some people in the white nationalist movement and who he sat with on, um, sat with on panels at conferences and stuff like that. And basically he was, he was using the, 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 the moniker that he didn't know who they were. And um, hashtag don't know who they are. Yeah. He didn't know who, who the white nationalists were that he was sitting on these panels with. And or what organizations they were with, um, and that was pr- it's pretty much bullshit. I mean, um, some of the organizations that uh, Lou Barletta has associated himself with um, are pretty much connected with the modern alt right movement, and pretty much can be traced back to uh, you know Richard Spencer and uh, Elizabeth Town College professor uh, Paul Gottfried starting the HL Mencken Club back in two thousand eight. One of the people that he sat with at this uh, at CPAC back in two thousand eleven. Was uh, was a guy named with Kevin Deanna who started this organization called Youth for Western Civilization, um, and the, he also sat on a panel with uh, Tom Tancredo, uh, Virgil Good, who was the former uh, congressman from Charlottesville, Virginia, or Char- yeah, no, yeah, Charlottesville, Virginia, and then um, Babe Buchanan, who was Pat Buchanan's sister. And so I started digging into some of the people that uh, Barletta has associated himself with. And, you know, those connections are pretty significant with the alt-right movement. Um, Kevin Deanna, as I was a keynote speaker back in 2009 at the HL Mencken Club, um, which, is, which was started by uh, 
Richard Spencer and Paul Godfrey, and this is where they start the alt right movement pretty much at this organization. It's one of the first uh, time they gave a speech uh, to tell the decline and rise of the alt right, of the alternative right. And um, also another person who spoke at that conference in 2009 was given a, a was given a um, keynote was Pat Buchanan, Dave Buchanan's um, brother. Brother, yes. So there, these connections are you know being pretty much laid out. Um, there's he you know there's other um, times that uh, that um, Barletta sat on anti-immigrant panels with uh, someone named Peter Brimlow who was or used to write for a website called VDare. Um, I think he was fired from a conservative website for making a pretty racist article back in 2012 on the website VDare. Um, Brimlow has also spoken at every single or held a panel at every single HL Magazine Club conference, um, yearly conference since 2008. So this person is definitely hooked up with the Richard Spencer movement, uh, the white nationalist movement, the alt-right. And um, another person he sat with a panel with was uh, invited by was Pat Buchanan. So, I mean, there's these connections that are there between um, uh, Lou Barletta and really like the inner workings of the modern alt-right movement that's been going on. Yeah, well, there you have it. You know, I, I you know, you had you had kind of gotten in touch with me about when you first started hearing about some of this stuff, and what what I thought was important, and some of the work that you dug in on was actually finding the videos of him um, at these conferences, right? So, so there's no question whatsoever. I mean, you kind of take screenshots of this, um, some of the panel stuff, and looking at with this guy actually on the panel, sitting right next to some of these individuals, um, and. You can't deny that you don't know who this person is when you're sitting there laughing along with them, talking with them, um, and being part of that engagement. And and that's not just a one-off event. This has been a long-term association. Yeah, and stuff like this has been happening for a while. So, uh, for instance, like when he kicked off his campaign, had a campaign kickoff event in the Lancaster, you know, Lehigh Valley area, one of the people he invited was uh, someone named Jack Pasovich. Um, he is someone who is uh, pretty much a Pizzagate conspiracy theorist where, uh, you know, a bunch of people in the alt-right believe that uh, Podesta was running a child sex ring out of the basement of this pizza shop. Uh, Pasovic showed up to this pizza shop and started uh, filming a kid's party going on in the back just to, like, see what was going on and have ha-ha, have fun. And he was actually asked to leave. And a couple of weeks after that incident, someone actually showed up to this pizza place with a gun and started shooting at it right. from the outside. And so this person, Pasovich, was invited to this campaign kickoff held by the Lehigh Valley Tea Party uh, in Allentown. And this event was protested from uh, the Make the Road Pennsylvania, the pro-immigrant, the immigrant defense group. And... You know, talking to a couple of people who actually attended the event, uh, Pasovich wasn't even going in the front doors of the, the main entrances. He's actually had he was going in and out of the back door. You know, so he had special access to this event. So it makes you wonder if this person was invited by Barletta's people or by the Tea Party people in, from this group. Right. Right. And um, another instance was back in 2014, 2013. Um, there's a skinhead uh, who was one of the founders of the Keystone State Skinheads named Stephen Smith. And he took a picture of Lou Barletta. And at the time when this photo circulated online, once again, Barletta said he did not know who this person was. And then Stephen Smith uh, won as a write-in candidate to become a county chair of the Luzerne County GOP. And uh, he, is four year, he was the only person to write himself in. So he won that seat as the chairman. Or as a, like sitting on the, the board or whatever. And um, when he ran again for re-election, he ran like seven, something like 80 or 90 percent of all the precincts within Luzerne County. So oh, uh, it was the type of thing where, uh, you know, Lou Barlett denied he didn't, did not know who this person was. But it just seems like he's a magnet for these uh, people to come to him, which, you know, is still a problem. Right. Well, you know, the good news is, is I think that this um, this kind of reporting is actually finally getting some traction. Right. Um, I mean, it's the, the fact that you see some associations making even into kind of CNN. Right. I mean, this this is important. And, I, you know, I have to say is I don't think um, that had it not been for the kind of, say, movement politics that we see out there that have emerged um, in the aftermath of Trump, 
Um, I don't think we would have seen um, people digging in in this way and getting traction. I mean, of course, I mean, you've been kind of reporting on the background of these folks for a long time. Um, and the fact that um, we're actually getting some eyes on this stuff um, is really important. Because, look, I mean, part of the playbook for these people now is to try to fly below the radar, um, to come across as kind of like normal, as kind of acceptable, all this other kind of stuff. Uh, and meanwhile, they are hooked into the most extremist um, aspects of our country. Yeah. Well, and also this is what happens when you have a Republican go unchallenged in a primary, right? I mean, there's one person running against uh, against um, Barletta, and that is Jim Christiana. But, I mean, pretty much other Republicans cleared the field for Barletta to be the outright favorite here. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeff Bardos left the Senate campaign uh, to team up with Wagner, run a slate for lieutenant governor, um, governor and lieutenant governor. Um, Rick Saccone dropped out of the race to uh, run a, as a special candidate out in um, Western PA for the PA-16 that's coming up against Connor Lamb. So pretty much Republicans have cleared the field for uh, Barletta to pretty much run in this race on the pose. Um, Christiana is like a 30 some year old young Republican who's pretty much raising a name for himself. Uh, I don't, he doesn't have a chance of winning this, but like you look at like what happened here with Barletta and what just happened um, in Chicago or in Illinois with Arthur Jones, who used to be the head of the, um, the American Nazi party. He ran unopposed on a Republican primary ticket and will now be running in a congressional race on Illinois, uh, you know, third congressional district, which is a heavily democratic seat, but still, you know, the Republicans decide not to put anyone up, and now you have a a Nazi hmm. for running as the Republican ticket, and it just it, it normalizes this, this type of behavior. Exactly right, and and like, we're not talking like you know, figurative Nazi here. Right? No, I mean, I'm not saying I don't like you because you're a fascist. Right. It's like an actual capital right. F fascist. Right. Exactly. And this is like the type of people that Barletta has been hanging out with for the past 10 years. I mean, he can deny all he wants that he knows he did not know who these people were. But I mean, he's been hanging out with people who are capital F fascists. You know, people associate with the Richard Spencer movement, Peter Brimelow, Pat Buchanan, Dave Buchanan, um, Kevin Deanna. I mean, these are just some of the people like you start rolling off these names. And these are people all associated with the alt-right, white nationalist, neo-Nazi movements here in the United States. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. So this is why, you know, again, need to pay attention to folks. This is why we do what we do here. This is why Sean has been kind of like, you know, on this stuff for a while. Because, uh, like, we this should be part of our common sense stuff that we just know. Um, and not the, this should not be surprising. This should not be, like... Oh my God! I didn't know this kind of stuff. We need to start learning this stuff and pay attention to this stuff to know that this is the our, the actual political environment that we're working in. We've got an kind of alt right slash Trumpian um, slate of candidates, right? Right down from like local elections right up to the kind of race for the governor um, in this state. And you know, Pennsylvania has you know really. I mean, we're talking about on the front lines. Um, and he's also part of this organization called Fair, the immigrant anti immigrant organization. Yeah. You know, it started back in 1979, uh, pretty much as like, you know, the pretty much ran like they started out as the modern alt-right movement today. I mean, they're like 30, 40 years ahead of their time. And this is the type of thing where, you know, look at who gets, you know, people, um, Chris Kobach um, and other people within the Trump administration have all gone through this organization called FAIR. Uh, Stephen Miller. I mean, these are like these are these people here are, you know, anti-immigrant um, radicals that are coming out of this group and they're heavily associated with the far right and the ultra alt right. Crazy. Well, let, let's move in over to some more kind of like some of the saner aspects of Pennsylvania <laughs> Republicans. Uh, let's talk about uh, the douche. I mean, Dush, uh, Representative Dush, um, who is basically looking to kind of impeach the entire Supreme Court, Pennsylvania Supreme yes. Court. <laughs> yes. Um, so why why are these people just going ape shit over this stuff? <laughs> So you have two things that are going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you have uh, Senator Scarnati and um, Representative Terzai, who have refused to hand over uh, the gerrymandering data to um, the state Supreme Court, which they should actually be in contempt of court over that. Um, and uh, so today's the deadline for the maps to be redrawn from the legislature. Instead of doing it over the they, – they, they just ran themselves out of time, didn't even bother doing it. And um, – so pretty much what their theory is, not comply with the Supreme Court at all, make a more gerrymandered map, send it over to the Supreme Court without getting voted on in either uh, caucus without or either chamber, 
and say, here's your map, take it or leave it. And once the governor and the Supreme Court denies the map, they're going to try to take this to federal court again, essentially slowing down this process and forcing the, t- the 2018 elections to be done with uh, the current maps that are in place. Um, and their argument is going to be that the legislature, it's not in the power of the Supreme Court uh, to remake the maps. It's a strictly a legislative process, even though it did not go through the legislature. Um, it, you know, it's just drawn by the by the party leaders. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't not even voted on in either chamber um, because they simply ran out of time for it. So this, that's what um, Scarnati and Terzai have been doing, uh, obstructing and dragging their feet and defying the Supreme Court. Uh, Chris Dush who's from like the central Allegheny forest area of Pennsylvania. Uh, he believes that uh, he, all five of the state Supreme courts, Supremes who voted to get vote in favor of ending partisan gerrymandering uh, should be impeached, which <sighs> is not going to go anywhere, but still it's just as crazy and dangerous to be suggesting that because the path the Republican party has been going down over the past 20 years. And so it's, you know, ramping up under, um, ramping up under Trump because simply because you don't have an agreement with the court, you should just get rid of them. Right. Which is and, what any authoritarian country pretty much does. Right. Exactly. And so, you know, we've got this timeline case, right? They already tried, like they already, they already tried to kind of like get the U S Supreme court to uh, basically overturn this. So, um, but of course, Supreme court would not, not hear this at all because it's based upon the Pennsylvania, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, um, constitution, not the, the U S constitution. So they don't rule on these cases. So they rightly punted that, um, even the conservative members of the court punted that said, no, no, we don't see this kind of stuff. Um, we don't violate this. So now we're looking at this kind of, in, kind of deadline, like, right? um, Wolf or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I mean, technically governor Wolf will present this, um, if it goes through the entire process, it's supposed to submit, um, a updated maps. Um, and again, it's still going to be based on the 2010 census, right? So they're still using data from 2010 census. Um, the, the maps, the deadline is February 15th, right? So that stuff has to be on February 15th. And, um, most people are saying, right. Um, that they well, are, maps, have to be, maps are due today. Maps are due today, but Wolf has to send that stuff forward to the, yeah. um, to the Supreme court by the, by the 15th. Right. And, um, the, the the Pennsylvania Republicans have been saying, eh, I don't think we're going to meet the deadline. We're not going to beat the deadline. And so there's all these questions out there now about what's going to happen. So let's just assume that the, the power play from the Pennsylvania Republicans, the GAP, GOP is going to be, okay, we're not going to issue new maps. Or we're going to issue maps that are basically going to keep in place the gerrymandering that we had before. Right, with maybe some slight changes. That goes to Wolf, and then Wolf basically has to decide whether or not he's going to go forward with that stuff, and all this by February 15th. If that does not happen, if the deadline is not met, or the maps don't there, or they do not, do not meet the muster for what the Supreme Court, um, the, the court said it will issue a district map itself. Right. Um, and they've already hired uh, Nathaniel uh, Persley, I guess his name is, from the Stanford Law to advise on the plan. And the court has also invited Democrats and Republicans to submit maps that meet, that meet a list of criteria, including keeping counties, townships, municipalities and same districts wherever possible, um, ensuring roughly the same number of voters in each district so that each person's vote is roughly the same power uh, and keeping districts compact. I should say I'm reading from um, uh, what's this the Washington Post article that was um, was on this so that. Um, um, all that is kind of happening as as we speak, and all that stuff is in motion. So it seems like at some well, at some level, you've got some of the nut jobs on the on the right are basically welcoming that scenario and seeing that as a way to kind of like fan the flames of outrage to try to kind of uh, make some other kind of partisan claim against the Supreme Court by saying, "Look, you know, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has um, gone against the voters' wishes and all this kind of stuff." Basically, fulfilling what Dush, I mean, Dush um, was basically saying in that um, you, you know that chance you, you had to ask him that question. Yeah, and he uh, so but on Tuesday, Budget Day, a bunch of activists uh, were going around uh, yelling, "Release the maps!" and visiting the offices of Terzai, Reed, and um, Scarnati, Corman, and Dush. And as uh, Dush was not in his office, but there are about twenty people in there. They're confronting uh, Sonny um, from Erie County, Erie, Pennsylvania. He was saying that he does not believe the maps are that heavily gerrymandered. Um, you listen to the full place thing we placed on our Facebook page. And they are. And during that middle of the confrontation, uh, Dush walks in. I had the opportunity to ask him why he, we should teach the Supreme Court. And he just goes right into his talking points. And as that uh, they, a bunch of yelling and screaming happens, you know, he gets shouted down and just, all right, I'm done here and leaves. Uh, says, this is my office. And- this is my office. 
<laughs> but then uh, Dush continues to go on a rant of epic proportions. He posted like a 500 word like rant on his Facebook page Wednesday afternoon, um, basically linking, uh, you know, the PA Supreme Court to uh, Hitler and Stalin. Um, <laughs> this is it's an actual paragraph. Take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah, take a deep breath. Everybody settle in. Here you go. Anytime we permit an element of government to assume authority without following the rule of law, we head down the same road as Germany under Hitler and the Soviet Union under Lenin and more severely Stalin. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the academics, media and government insiders that put them on that path factually incorrect but i digress <laughs> I it's really wish... hard to get through it right without doing that right it's true <laughs> i honestly wish you could make it mandatory that anyone taking a position of trust in the commonwealth especially those who sit on the bench would go to buchenwald to see the inevitable ends to violating the rule of law and for those of you who do not know uh buchenwald was a notorious german concentration camp where you know, tens of thousands of Jewish people were sent there to die. <laughs> this is actually the world we live in now, folks. This is the state. You know, I get, we, and the, the, if it didn't make matters, work, Doug, this is coming from a guy, right, as part of a caucus, right, that is anti gay, anti transgender, anti woman, right, anti Jew, right, anti. All the people who were sent to the concentration camps, right? This guy is basically locked up in front of, right? Yeah, anti-union, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Anti the academics, the union leaders, uh, the Catholics, the Jews, the the gays, the transgender, like the disabled, the immigrants, the gypsies, like yeah, pretty much anyone you could check off the list who went to the concentration camps. These people are against, and this is where he, yeah. That, that just. They should get a Buchenwald for a history lesson. Right, right, right. You know, it just reminds me. You know, it's like it's like the. You wonder what this person reads. You know, there's that famous, you know, uh, that that statement by uh, Martin Neumoller, right? You know, they, you know, was kind of reflecting, and it kind of goes like this. It says, you know, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me, right? So I think when, when, when people like him, when they read that, what they see is like, I want to be the they in that sentence. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I want to be the one that comes for these people. Right. And this is, I mean, I, I, that's what they, that's exactly who, what they're doing. And yet they're so freaking like, they don't even miss Jordan a beat reality. and flipping that around and being like, you know, like becoming the, the victims. Who drove the his Germans to Nazi Germany, not the people running in the streets, the thugs beating the shit out of the opposition. You know, like yeah. the brown shirts or the black shirts. It wasn't them who drove Germany or or uh, Italy to fascism. It was the you know liberal academics who were defending <laughs> a free and open society. Exactly, who drove Germany. Yeah, that, that you that, know who that caused way. you know who caused the real cause of Nazi of the Nazi Germany and all the concentration camps and all the kind of death that happened with that and all the genocide that was taking place. Right, it had to do with those people that wanted a more open and inclusive society, Sean. Yeah, they it was were the liberal blamed. mainstream media. Yeah, it's, just, it's like makes your freaking head spin, right? And to know that Pennsylvania, like we're at the heart of this stuff right now, is something else. Yeah, and like the people in their caucus know that like these people are nuts, but they still they there, there's there's no censure coming out of this. There's no disavowing of this type of rhetoric. And I mean, like literally, what like what like we didn't talk about the Trump parade, but like what Dush and Trump are doing is what despots love right. to do i mean what's happening over in uh they, like they want a constitutional crisis going on they're forcing a constitutional crisis in pennsylvania by not uh complying with the supreme court and are threatening to impeach the supreme court but i mean this is the type of stuff that happens in turkey like this is what's happening in turkey right now right well oh, you know we don't get we don't we don't get a court ruling we like okay we'll just throw this these people off the bench and install people who we want I mean, elections have consequences. Yeah. <laughs> like, there I mean, you go. Like when, when 
when Trump gets elected and Gorsuch gets in place, their, their, their thing is, well, you know, elections have consequences. But when these democratically elected Supremes vote against gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering, they want to throw them off the bench. And they, 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 they can't have it both ways. Yeah, but they want it both ways. You know, and I have to say that, you know, you mentioned there, I said, you know, these people in their caucus know that these people are off their rock or whatever like that. You know what? I don't give a shit, man, because this is the same problem, right? You, what, let, okay, let's say, so these are the same people. Let's put this in context. Well, those folks who know that these people are crazy and do not speak out and do not turn to such of them, right? Like, okay, just just replace Chris Dush, right? Chris Dush with Jerry Sandusky, all right? What happened there? What happened? Let replace right Chris Douche with like Catholic priest abusing children, right? The same principle applies here, right? Yes, those are extreme examples, but it's the same kind of stuff. You can't tell me that there weren't all these people that are around Jerry Sandusky that were saying like, "Oh my God, I heard this guy's actually abusing kids." You can't tell me that there weren't people that work at every freaking Catholic church that knew that these priests were actually out there and were abusing those kids, and they were saying, "Oh my God, I can't believe did you hear blah blah blah," and they did nothing. That's part of the problem. Right. So I don't care if these people want are trying to rescue their own sense of morality or personal ethics. Right. By telling you or telling whoever the hell else to like, oh, we know these people are really crazy. Right. Then step up and do freaking something about it. Right. You can't let these people run roughshod over our democracy. And yet you are. So don't tell me until you come out and censor those people, you are walking right behind them. You're, you're, you might not be wearing a brown shirt right now, but you sure as hell got the suit and you sure as hell got the uniform of the Republican Party that is driving it in that direction. So frickin' I, I've had it with those people. Crazy. Ah, so that's fun. <laughs> Good thing we've got a Democratic governor that is kind of looking to improve our economy by, by selling off our resources and speeding up the permitting of oil and gas like a true progressive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not to make too abrupt of a transition. <laughs> well, I would say there was one thing uh, that came up at the budget uh, press conference afterwards. Yeah. Um, Republicans are upset that uh, – Wolf is not pushing for the privatization of the permitting process as he was supporting last year uh, when it came to supporting a Marcellus shale tax. Oh, baby. So that, that, that's the, you know, the whatever. That's the hill they're going to die on this year, I guess, right? Yeah. So, you know, what? I, I, I really is, I started to gear up for today's show, Sean, with, uh, you know, because, the, you know, Wolf did have his budget address this week. And, you know, new numbers come out and new suggestions come out and we get to see a return of some of the things that he proposed in his first budget address when he first got elected and had a pretty significant mandate. Um, but, you know, it's like, you know, the, the story is going to play itself out. Right. I mean, and then Republicans are going to go after this stuff. Um, and then in the end, uh, we're going to end up with, you know, a worse situation. I mean, you know, it's like one of the things I know we, we haven't talked about at all in this uh, podcast lately at, at all at all. But, like, there's been some hard pandering going on from the Republicans and Democrats and Wolf to try and get Amazon, the Amazon headquarters located in Pennsylvania. That's a real, that's a, that's a real good point. Yeah, we haven't even talked I about mean, that yet, have we? We haven't talked about, the, like, the effects that that would have in Pennsylvania, you know? What, what would happen bringing 50,000 people into a geographical location and the economic, um, like, economic hardships that are gentrifying – I mean, Philadelphia is being gentrified rapidly. Pit parts of Pittsburgh are being gentrified rapidly. Out here, it's going on a little bit. But I mean, say like, you know, uh, 50,000 people decide to up and move here in the middle of Pennsylvania with the Amazon H2 headquarters. Mm -hmm. I'm out of a place to live. <laughs> yeah. Like, because my standard of living ain't going up. Like, you know, like. That, oh, right you just now. get a job with Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can work on like, the warehouse making a minimum wage, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, like it. it we're, 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 we're engaging in this race to the bottom to try and bring Amazon here to Pennsylvania to score brownie points. And really the governor, it's one of the first things the governor, um, you know, let off with, like if we don't have an, a competing minimum wage or, you know, an actual education system that's funded or an infrastructure plan that's here in Pennsylvania, you know, we don't have good roads or good bridges, or we don't have a good public education system or a higher education system. You know, companies like Amazon don't want to come here. And he said that like pretty much like right off the bat. Yep. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, this is uh, 
Yeah, I th- I th- we, we got to put that on the agenda for next week. We should kind of dig into that a little bit more because I think that. Uh, you, but you're right because we even talk about that and we talk about the impact of what I have. You know, Amazon's already got a huge footprint in the state as it is. I mean, you know, I, I drive by um, just about every day on my on my on my drive to work when I'm going down the, the 222 bypass. I pass the um, g- ginormous uh, Amazon warehouse that was built there. Right. And you can already see the, the huge impact that that has had. Right. I mean, we, the, the 222 bypass was originally built in order to kind of um, alleviate some of the congestion um, around in 222. Right. And it actually did. But, you know, like everything, uh, when it you fills get, in. And- well, exactly. Is that once you get a, a bypass, you actually get a, kind of a, a, some good roads, new roads in. What happens? You get build up around that. So the first thing that came out was like they extended up all the warehousing um, that, had, you know, was already right around the Fogelsville area. Right. Kind of like we get intersection of 100 and, and, and two. 22, you already had a kind of pretty significant warehouse structure in there. Um, but once that bypass got built, boom, in comes Amazon, right, and fills up, you know, God, I mean, how many city blocks on worth of where, warehousing space. And now that, that 222 bypass, right, is like, you're, you know, you're clogged with trucks all the time, right, um, kind of bring products in and out of there. Um, you're already starting to see some wear on the roads and that kind of thing. You start talking about bringing the kind of, it's, you know, HQ2 in, right, and then you're talking about a whole other um, kind of uh, kind of other impact, right, from the other end of the economic spectrum and kind of putting not only you, you kind of have, you know, the low wage jobs you're coming in with the with the warehouse, but now you're actually going to be kind of like increasing, the, um, you know, you know, basically gentrifying an entire region. Yeah. Crazy, like I said. Yeah, let's let's come back to that. We should dig into that. You're right, because there's a, um, a whole bunch of other issues there. There's been also some interesting stuff around, um, you know, unionization attempts and things like this. It's some Amazon warehousing. So we should come back to that maybe next week. That's good. Um. All right, so before we come out the break, I just want to kind of put this on people's radar, too, as well. This past week, I've had um, uh, – you may have come across my piece called um, Poshy Budget Games Exposed Again. The Bunces Report Pushes Back Against Austerity. Um, and this is basically uh, – in that article I, post, I, I published on Raging Chicken – it's about a group of faculty at Kutztown University, um, kind of full disclosure, I'm one of them, um, basically commissioned an independent report that would get in and dig into the finances of Kutztown University and the Pashi system. They would basically give some independent eyes um, on um, the the actual budget situation of the university and the um, um the state system. And so we got this guy, Howard Bunces, right? We've known about Howard Bunces before. And again, this guy, let's, let's be clear, this guy comes in and basically what um, what he does, um, he's a renowned expert for basically um, getting underneath the kind of budget myths and actually kind of presenting a budget system and teaching people like me, like faculty members, like people that are always at the receiving end of the kind of like sky is falling budget crisis nonsense. Um, and that watching kind of jobs disappear, restructuring happen under the kind of shock doctrine policies. Bunces is a person who can come in, right, and kind of provide you the kind of report and breakdown by looking at the actual financial situation of the institutions and providing you some um, kind of tools be able to kind of, you know, kind of talk back against this. Um, and we've known for a while, if you just kind of go back to the very beginning of Raging Chicken Press, uh, my first article in Raging Chicken Press was about exactly these issues, um, and I've been reporting on that over the years. Um, so for me, um, this was the, what came out of the Bunces report was not entirely new. Um, it was kind of expected, uh, frankly. But um, it's a it, it's a narrative that's it, it's extraordinarily difficult for some reason for people to hold on to, right? So the basic findings of the Bunces report were that like Pashi, right, is essentially sitting on the state system of higher education is simply sit, sitting on um, a set of reserves, right? Um, um, uh, well, let's put it that unrestricted liquidity is kind of what I called it in the article, um, about a one point three billion dollars. And why is that number important? That number is important because it says, okay, that's the kind of discretionary budget. So in other words, there are some things in a budget or in kind of a finances of, a, of any institution that there's money that you cannot touch. Like, so for example, if you've got a state grant um, or matching funds from a state to build a particular building and that those funds were restricted, right, under the terms of that grant um, for that building, right, you can't take money from that grant and then, I don't know, pay for books for students or hire more faculty for it. It's restricted to that, right? So we get that. So that's pile number one. Pile of money number one is for that. Pile of number um, money number two has to do with kind of predictable expenses, right? So in other words, you know you have X number of employees, 
right? And they have benefits, right? And all that kind of stuff. You have outlays of, you know, some subscriptions from the library, a whole bunch of stuff, you know, that, that you know that are expenses that you have to pay, right? They can't just choose not to give us a paycheck one week, right? They have to do that. Those are a, another set of expenses that you can't, um, that you, that are you restricted from, right? You can't kind of take money from salaries and put it over someplace else, right? Um, just for that. So you got that one. So that's those. Then in the middle, right, there's all this f- money, right, this funding that um, is discretionary. And by discretionary, that means universities, administrations determine and choose where that money goes, right? So if they're going to build, say, for example, they wanted to establish a new program like that at Kutztown University in kind of social media st- um, strategy and theory, right? Um, or if they want to establish a new program in, um, in say, I don't know, digital design or something like this, and they know that if you actually want to attract, or say like animation, and you, if you know if you want to attract students, right, and you want to build a good program, you're going to need, so for example, state-of-the-art computing stuff and, and kind of modeling software and that kind of thing. So that's the kind of stuff where that's a choice by the university, right? And then they say, okay, in order to get there in three years, right, we're going to have to put X number of dollars, um, like, in a savings account, right, toward that end, okay? That's a discretionary thing. So basically what it means is that a university is making a choice to establish that kind of program and set aside money for it in the future, okay? And again, there is absolutely 100% nothing wrong with that. And I would argue that is actually good, right? That's the way that you actually want to plan for stuff. So instead of actually, you know, just taking out a bunch of bonds or or loans or something like this, you're actually saving for the future. And that's actually a fairly responsible way to move forward. Okay. The problem is twofold. Number one is that those budgets are presented to faculty and staff and students as if they're the actual financial situation of the university. So, for example, if they're going to take, say, $300,000 a year and put it into a, an, an account for a future program, right, they record that on their balance sheets as a cost, right? So it records and they can show it to you and it looks as if that money has disappeared, that you've actually spent that money, okay? But that money has not been spent, okay? So they have a budget which includes all their wish list of stuff in there, right? And that's what they want, And then they record it and they say, here's the money that this is our budget. This is what shows us what our costs are, right? Even though a huge chunk of those costs are not actual money that's been spent. It's money that's sitting in savings accounts. And then they find out that the money that they're taking in kind of comes slightly below that. Then they say, oh, no, we have a deficit. But it's not a real deficit. It's a, not a real – it's a deficit best, based only by what they want. Now, the problem is is that if they laid all that stuff on the table, then we would actually have to have a real discussion about choices. Faculty and staff and students would have to be included into a university's kind of long-term plan to determine what we actually um, need to do, where we need to prioritize things. And the administration knows that faculty are going to say, look, the mission of this place is education. So as much as it would be nice to have a grand new like fountain complex with like, you know, outdoor coffee shops and things like this, as much as that might be great, it might be good for your PR stuff, right? That is essentially not the core mission of the university. We need to make sure that the academics of the university are protected, right? And by protected, we don't mean like forcing students to take a whole bunch of online, um, you know, online contracted out classes in order to meet their degrees, right? They, so we want the investment in the classroom. Right. But what the university keeps on saying is that we have no money. We have no money. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. So anyways, that's the background. So we see that as the one thing is we find out that the state system of higher education is sitting on about one point three billion dollars um, in in reserves. Right. Kutztown University. Right. Has reserves that are kind of, you know, you know, something about, you know, eighty seven million dollars. <clears throat> OK. Same kind of stuff. So the problem here is, is that what the administration is presenting to everyone else is that, you know, here's our actual, this is where the money is, is gone. We have, we don't have any money. What's actually true is that, no, a whole bunch of stuff, they have chosen, chosen one thing as opposed to the other. Okay. So the Bunsis report comes out and exposes this by looking at the actual audited reports and actual cash flows of the university. Right. So if you're looking at what money was actually expended, not money that they put into a budget was a picture of their wish list, then you're finding out these universities are actually in fairly strong financial health. Okay. Um, so there's that piece number one. Then in the Bunsis report, and this is the, the other thing that's important, what was found out is that they, 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 number one, 
consistently over the past several years, I think it goes back to 2008, over the past several years since 2008, consistently, and this is true even before then, underreport revenue. Right. So in other words, they basically are very pessimistic in terms of like the number of students coming in and how many how much tuition they're actually going to be receiving the university. So they basically under budget for that. Right. Again, on their wish list, they say that they're going to get a lot less than they actually do. Right. And they report pension contributions like cost for health and like benefits and kind of long term retirement stuff and all that. They basically like over report the amount of money that the university is actually paying to this by like a factor of two or three. Right. So you look at their budget and you see, oh, my God, like 50 percent or even more than 50 percent of its of the university's budget is going towards pensions. Oh, my God, the sky is falling. Oh, my God, they're spending so much money on faculty. I can't believe it. Right. Um, No wonder it's costing so much. And no wonder that all this kind of stuff. When in reality, it's not true. When you actually compare it to what the actual costs are, money that has gone out towards these pension, it's like 19 percent, not 48 percent or 50 percent or something like this. It's crazy. Right. So this Bunces report, by the way, lays all this stuff out. All right, you can go read about that in Raging Chicken Press. The one thing I want to let people know about is that so next week at Kutztown University uh, at 11 a.m. in Academic Forum Room 101, um, this is February 15th at 11 a.m., Academic Forum Room 101, Howard Bunces is actually coming to campus, um, coming to Kutztown University's campus um, to talk about this report. Um, the faculty union has started to weigh in on this, um, right, about what their position are. And they're really, the faculty union's position has been pretty much, okay, look, you know, now that we have this information, we want to work with the administration. We want to find ways of kind of dealing with this stuff. This should be a new start, right? All the same kind of stuff. I'm highly pessimistic that that's going to go anywhere. Um, and uh, I was confirmed in my, my expectation were when the university president yesterday um, sent out a kind of quote unquote budget um, description about his financial situation of the university that was like the sky has literally fallen already, right? That the university is going to have to kind of do a drastic measures in order to kind of make up for its, its budget shortfalls. And so basically now we have a standoff between um, the two different versions of um, the university's financial health. One coming from the university president, who's basically doubled down in a way to try to kind of like preempt this um, discussion for Bunces and the report and the analysis and the analysis that's coming from Bunces. So that's all going to play itself out in the next week or so. Um, it looks like that um, here either on in Raging Chickens uh, Out to Coop Extra, um, I will be talking with Howard Bunces um, or I will be talking with him and kind of reporting on our, our on our discussion, on our interview um, in the pages of Raging Chicken. We're going to see. We're trying to set up a time that we can both talk about that. Um, I'll also have some reports um, live from the um, um, or recorded actually live from the Bunces um, talk on the 15th. Just want to put that on everybody's uh, radar. I've got another piece that I'm working on right now. It's going to be a follow-up of some of this stuff. Um, it's going to be a little bit more, uh, you know, um, more of the same kind of what I did last time. Um, I, you know, like I said, faculty union is trying to kind of, you know, take the high road, high road here and is trying to say, look, we're going to kind of work with the administration, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't see any evidence that that's going to happen. And so the big question is, um, where do we go? Right. Um, so I'm just going to kind of leave it at that point. So the other thing I should say, um, I have to mention this, and I've been in touch with some folks that are involved with some student activists. Um, part of what the university is shopping out right now with its sky, it's falling kind of quote unquote budgeting that it just released to faculty is they're actually planning on rolling out a new student fee as a way of making up for their budget shortfalls, quote unquote. Right. Um, which we were highly um, kind of skeptical of. Um, they're introducing something called a student success fee. Right. And I just want to read this. Considerable declines in enrollment over the past seven years and state funding levels have not kept up with rising costs, have resulted in millions of dollars of lost revenue. In addition, rising costs have significantly outpaced modest tuition revenue growth. At the same time, the need for student service support services and intervention continues to rise. So therefore, we are going to implement this student success fee. This is a brand new fee. So essentially, this is kind of like, yes, we have modest tuition increase, but we're going to have the actual cost the students are planning on going up as a unit university refuses to recognize what it is doing with its budgeting, the same kind of logic and budgeting that brought us the financial crisis of 20, um, 2008. Um, that's what's happening at the university, and they're going to do it on the backs of students. Um, so this is something that um, I'm going to be digging in on, and as I have been digging in on, um, because, you know, look, one, I'm invested in it. 
right? I believe in the mission of public higher education, right? Um, I've had the, the, the quality of my, my, my teaching life and my professional life degrade substantially since I came to Kutztown University in 2002 um, and all part of the same logic. And they're just doubling down on this stuff and they refuse to see the light um, despite all the evidence to the contrary. So that's what I got on my plate this coming week, Sean. So what's this like success thing? <clears throat> Look, it's a way of plugging their budgets. Right. So, but I so, mean, like, like, what's the success based on? Like, you pay more, so you'll be more successful. So the university will be able to pay its budgets. That's the idea. <laughs> Look, here's the deal, right? So, what what the university has in the past, we've seen that we have specific fees, right? Um, that that go at, at Kutztown University. They go CUSI, which is Kutztown University Student Services, something or other, right? Um, the kind of fees that kind of go in there to support a bunch of things that are related to the students, right? And it's technically under the control of student government. But so, for example, the student union building is technically owned by um, students. It comes from student fees, right? But what happens? The university decides what it does. It kind of says, ask the student body, right? Oh, you know, do, you know, you can we want to do these kind of things? And shows all its numbers and all this kind of stuff. And a student government generally rubber stamps that stuff, and the university goes on and spends those fees. So, you know, for the new Starbucks, for example, right? Um, they you have a Starbucks that it's in there, and they kind of re renovated the entire building and stuff that came out in part from student fees. Um, this money, um, it's not clear about what it is going to be designated for. Um, it does say that, uh, well, here, I'll give you, this is what it says. The revenue from the new student success fee would safeguard access to these important services, services such as... Um, uh, let's see. Reductions are result lower retention and graduation rates and, re and uh, recent investments in student services we have made. It would not be in the interest of our students to cut these budgets. It doesn't really say what they are. The revenue from the new student success fee would safeguard access to these important services that benefit all students, protect and enhance the quality of programs offered outside the classroom, and ensure that high-quality programs are available to students to be uh, will be retained and graduate on time. Funds raised from this fee would pay for current student success initiatives, such as the first-year experience cost, which is, by the way, something that is brand new because of the, the revisions of the general education system, right, uh, which we tried to send up all sorts of warnings on, but they didn't, right? They, didn't, they, they refused to tell us how they're going to pay for this stuff, and here we go. Now we know, right? Uh, personnel costs associated with student activities, right? In other words, the increase in management and non-teaching faculty who run a bunch of things. Career services, right? Support for study abroad programs and other services provide directly to students to assist with the retention and graduation. Additional uses of these resources could include could include uh, additional institutional financial aid, funds to provide better access to textbooks and other initiatives. This fee is currently in place at six of our sister universities. Does not name what those universities are. All right. <clears throat> so one thing to note about that language, it's not specific, right? It doesn't really tell you. It says that we have an idea about what student success is, right? And we're going to do this. So they're going to invest. And meanwhile, they've already signaled, they've started doing this at some of the departments of the university. They started basically taking their temporary faculty and, and cutting them from full-time and splitting them into part-time positions. So they're already doing that. They're already saying we're de-investing, disinvesting, right, from the classroom, and we're putting into these auxiliary services. Again, some of them are important, right? You want to basically students to have tutoring help and things like this? Absolutely. But then let's name what they are and things like this, and we should do this through appropriations, and we should do that through, instead of maybe kind of having nice, you know, pretty buildings all over the campus, maybe we should say, well, maybe we should invest in some of that money in students, not into administrators' wish lists. So we'll see. Bottom line, yeah. man, is that, you know, <laughs> students need to get in the game on this one, too, as well. Um, this is directly going after them. I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see some of the kind of the tuition schemes um, being uh, reintroduced into Pasha universities, um, which were, say, for example, at Millersville University, which caused tuition to go up by almost almost 20 percent. Um, this is this kind of like so-called paper credit scheme. Um, you could read about that and kind of pass pit issues of Raging Chicken Press, too, as well. But, uh, look, they're coming after the public higher ed once again. Um, and the, the funny thing is, is they're doing it all under, you know, the, the, the cloak of concern for students. Um, I don't know how you can have concern with students when you're talking about saddling them with more debt. There it is. Anyways, on that happy note, we are going to go into the last call. Uh, this has been Kevin Mahoney and will continue to be Kevin Mahoney after the break uh, from Raging Chicken Press. I'm the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We're going to come back with a little bit more fun stuff, uh, but maybe not. <laughs>
This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Over the past six years, we've brought unapologetic, progressive, activist media to Pennsylvania and beyond. We've helped hold those in power accountable and shine a light on some amazing activist work. We've broken national stories and established a reputation as an aggressive, independent media site. As newsrooms close and traditional journalists lose their jobs, hard-hitting, investigative news suffers. If we care about our democracy, we have to find new, sustainable models of journalism. And frankly, no one's going to do it for us. After the Trump election, we dug in even deeper. Thanks to some longtime members, one-time donations, and a shift in other resources, we brought on more writers and started paying them. Now we're doubling down and want to expand our infrastructure and pay our writers even more. We need to invest in our media if we have a chance to resist the unprecedented assault on democracy, working families, women's rights, and our planet. History will remember the choices we make today. So take a minute to become a member of Raging Chicken Press. For as little as $5 a month, the price of a local craft beer or a cup of coffee, you will be supporting homegrown progressive journalists and media activists. Go to RagingChickenPress.org and click on the Support and Membership tab to become a member. Leave a one-time donation or learn about other ways that you can help. We don't have billionaire backers. Keeping progressive, activist media going strong depends on you. Thank you for all your help and support. Keep up the fight. Welcome back to Out the Coop's Last Call. Woo! It's been a raucous week, everybody. We've got the Eagles victory. We've got the Keystone Progress Summit. Uh, got a whole bunch of stuff going on. But, you know... This week, I think you know we got to we got to start we got we got to start from the Eagles because Sean was kind of you know down there. I know we already talked about it some of the the the, the front of the show, uh, but you know I know this has got to be like huge moment for you. I know it's like for all you know these folks. Eagles never won a Super Bowl before, uh, and here you have it. It's been a long wait, so it's your moment in the sun, man. Yeah, I mean it, it, was, it was a great time down there. I mean, first of all, the Eagles winning the Super Bowl is pretty much like. The Cubs or the Red Sox winning the World Series for the first time in like 100 years. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's that type of magnitude. Philadelphia is a sports town, but the Eagles come first in that city. I mean, people talk about the Eagles all year long, no matter if they're playing or not. And it was it was a great time. I mean, I don't I, – when I moved out here, really like stopped watching the Flyers and the Phillies just because it's like later at night. I don't have a TV to watch all the time. But one of the things that keep up the – you know, is like my release from the week – of work or whatever is watching that Eagles game on Sunday. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it just is. And people, I know like people make critiques like blah, blah, blah. There's leftist critiques of like why you shouldn't be watching football or watching sports because of capitalism. I, I just throw that shit out to the window and say, screw it. I'm watching the Eagles. It's my like release of, from the week. It's, it's, it's how I, you know, just, you know, spend a few hours to myself watching the game and enjoying it. Right. And, uh, you know, I've been an Eagles fan all my life and you know, when they won, I, I I cried for a bit, <laughs> you know, mainly because I wish I, would, I was able to watch the game with my uncle, who you know passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was in his eighties. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer, passed away real quickly after the diagnosis. Yeah. But we would always be texting each other, at, you know, during the game or calling each other all the time during the football games. You know, even Phillies and all and stuff like that. And you know, uh, he would have absolutely loved watching this 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 Eagles team. <laughs> Same thing with my grandpa who just passed away. Uh, I mean like this is the, the like you know it, it's it's that type of thing like the, like people are wearing shirts like this one's for mom and dad. Yeah. I mean pretty much like that's how this city reacts with the Eagles. I mean like all the people who have passed away I never got to see the Eagles win a Super Bowl who wish they could have seen their parents could have seen it. Like this is the type of like that that's the type of sentiment that was going on. Um no and I have to and say that, you know I mean you know uh, with all those kind of like critiques of the football and all that kind of stuff, that kind of much broader sense. I get it. But I mean, you can't, I mean, I don't think you can separate out like, you know, like the culture of Philadelphia from, from the Eagles. I mean, there's so much embedded, you know, it, you know, I, I look at it like this is like, on the one hand, if you've got, if Rocky is kind of like, you know, the fictional, like cultural kind of icon that has kind of meant so much to the city, the Eagles are kind of one of the other parts of that. So, I mean, you know, people could critique it all you can't, but I mean, that's so much part of Philadelphia. 
Yeah, and there was decades of really bad football. Yeah. Like 70s and 80s going into the 90s of just like really, really bad football going on. And, you know, it turned around a little bit once Andy Reid here and he left, got fired. We ran him out of town after 14 years of not winning. And, you know, people thought this team was destined to lose. But, I mean, they turned around real quickly in the past couple of years. And, um, you know, like the, they won it because, you know, they had that like no one picked them to. Especially once their quarterback went down, went and then Foles stepped in, who was, you know, not that great of a – he's good, but he's not great. You know, he wasn't anything special when he was here. But, I mean, for like – Three weeks he put he put it together and you know he won won <laughs> he won us the Super Bowl. I mean, which, pretty much flawless football too, Sean. Yeah, and you know, like the the game on Sunday, I thought the Eagles were going to win it in a defensive. They're going to win it through defense. I didn't think they were going to win it in a shootout with Tom Brady. Yeah, but, but you know, I mean, this but is, this but is a slugfest. look, I'm a I'm a you know again I'm a long time look. I even got my Steelers on today, but it's like uh, I've got I'm a long time Steelers fan, and what always captivated me like when I was a kid was the Steelers' defense, right? In my mind, that is just ingrained in my brain about how you play defense. You play defense like you're playing offense, right? And that's what the Eagles have done this season, right? I mean, it's been – I mean, look, I've, I've only caught clips of different games and stuff like that. I did watch the entire Super Bowl. Um, but, man, watching their defense – and I said to my, I said to my son, too, and, and my daughter – this is like my daughter went to bed in the third quarter. She was actually really into it, but she just got really super tired. So we're sitting there. My wife, my son, and I are sitting there, and I said, look – I said, right now, I said, you got the shootout going back for the high scoring, which was like super exciting for like for him to watch and he was all cheering and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, But then when it came down to that last drive, I said to him, I said, and right before it happened, I said, so listen, so you see all that kind of stuff going on, but this is where it matters. Defense is what's going to win this. Watch the defense on this play because that's what matters. And had this been a year's pass with Andy Reid, Right, Andy Reid would have said, "Okay, he would have done just what the Democrats do." So, okay, let's play it safe now. We don't want to make anybody upset. Okay, play back, play back. No, no, no. He did exactly. And there was commentators about this afterwards all the time. They're basically saying what they did is they went in and they stayed aggressive. And sure enough, it was a defense that come in, finally got to Tom Brady and put the pressure on him, knocked that ball out of his hands. And right, and the defense is the one that secured that win. And that was like, I was like, I literally like probably woke up my neighbors on that when I was saying that because that was I, like. I was thrilled. I'm going to get that guy's jersey because I want him remembered. Graham, um, I yeah. want his name remembered, um, and I know he will in Philadelphia. But I mean, think uh, th- that's and the kind Graham of is like him. I mean, the team is full of people like an Andy Reid. Like people thought Brandon Graham was a bust for the first six years of his, years of his career. Um, you know, people always say yeah, but uh, there's this. Um, you know, we drafted Brandon Graham over the safety who's going to be like a Hall of Fame safety, pretty much out of Seattle. Mm-hmm. You know, this is who we drafted over this person. And, you know, he just put all those, like, <laughs> misnomers to rest. The short-armed, small defensive end that was picked higher than he should have been picked. And here he wins up the su- wins the Super Bowl. I mean, of, like, all the people who stuck around, Kelsey is another person, the, 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 the tackle. Mm-hmm. Uh, a short, like, a small, fast tackle. Or, no, center who, you know, usually, like, they're bigger, ath- less athletic. And, you know, the people who stuck around. I mean, it was just a – it was a great – uh, time. I mean, it didn't really hit me. Like once they got the fumble, I was like, "Oh my god, this is it!" Like that's where I, my my emotion was spent right there. Yeah, like, yeah. I had to keep myself from like crying. I was dying life. because like I, when I texted you, I said like, "Sean, man, this is like you're like, I think I'm still in shock." <laughs> <laughs> that was your text back to me. <laughs> I mean, like it took me like a good 10, 15 seconds. Like after the game it hit zero, I was like, "Oh my god!" I was just, like looking at the clock. Like, this is it. This it's over. <laughs> Like there, there's no other time left on the clock, <laughs> and they they won. I mean, I was down here yesterday. I wasn't partying it up like some people were, but I mean, it was a, it was pretty much a dance party going on down there. Um, they had all these jumbotrons set up from. Uh, they had like 17 jumbotrons set up from in front of the art museum steps, which is a great place to have the end of the parade. I mean, they couldn't have it anywhere else because of how many people they had to accommodate for this. Mm-hmm. I mean, it went all the way from South Philly up to the art museum steps. Um, well, I thought symbolically too, as well. I mean, you know, the Rocky. scene from Rocky. I mean, you know, that's like, uh, you know, I, I, that's that's just the iconic, you know, and that um, underdog space. mentality. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean that that, <clears throat> but also like the, uh, yeah, I mean, it pretty much like, and for, Philly's a Union city. I mean, it's pretty much like Philly, Eagles, and the Union <laughs> are like your three main things that like the people like the two main things that people care about in the city. Yep. It's a blue-collar city, and it's Eagles, and, 
you know, supporting that like union mentality. And this is that working class mentality. And, you know, they won. And I mean, people were out there just having a party. It was actually really funny. Some of the stuff I saw yesterday. I mean, people were like the mayor said, you know, no one's going to get that drunk by 11 o'clock in the morning. No, people were drunk by like six in the morning. I mean, there were people camping out on the parkway. Yeah. In front of the in front of the art museum overnight in like 20 degree weather after it got done like sleeting and freezing rain all day on wednesday um i mean there were people camped out there were people sleeping in their cars overnight i mean there were people who were not missing this parade i drove in from harrisburg wednesday afternoon and like driving freezing rain on the on the turnpike it was a nasty day <laughs> yeah i mean wednesday was not a great day to be driving back but i was like you know what i'm, I'm going <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm not missing this my sister went down there her boyfriend went down we didn't run into each other um but I mean, like they stayed down there until just as the parade passed. I left right away. But I mean, people, there was a lot of uh, drinking going on, a lot of smoking, <laughs> a lot of great signs that were up too. Man, well, you know, congratulations, yeah. all you Eagles fans out there. Uh, you know, like I've said, they did, huh? They, they replayed the Super Bowl in its entirety at eight o'clock in the morning. Oh my God! And like with tens of thousands of people standing on That's the parkway, so awesome. I was standing in. They had some good food trucks there, so I was at a food truck called Humpity Dumplings. Hmm. And it was like a dumpling food truck that like pretty much like stays in Philadelphia, but they were they got like the best food truck at Bonnaroo back in 2016. And so I had a cheesesteak dumpling, three cheesesteak dumplings and a couple of Asian pork dumplings, which came out to be really good. Oh, my God. That sounds amazing. Yeah. You're making I mean, me they hungry had a lot right of really now, good man. food trucks down there. And these weren't <laughs> like the food carts you grew up with. These are actual like UPS trucks turn into food right. trucks. Right, right, right. With right, a right. full blown kitchen inside of them. So nice. Yeah, there was a lot of there, there was a lot a lot of celebrating that was going on. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, that's freaking awesome. So, um, one, congratulations again, all of you know, uh, all the Eagles fans out there, and to Philadelphia as a city, because I think I know what it means culturally. Um, and you know, again, like I've said on this show before, you know, I, I grew up a Steelers fan, everything like that. But you know, one of the benefits of growing up a Steelers fan from uh, from you know, but growing up in New York was that I never got any of that kind of like anti Eagles stuff going on. I've always always loved the Eagles too, as well. As a matter of fact, one of my uh, one of my early uh, jerseys I had when I was a kid was an Eagles journey with Jaworski. Remember Jaworski? <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, I used to have number seven. I used to have, I used to wear that all the time. So it's like uh, you know, uh, Steelers been my team, but man. Here you go. Good job. And one of the things all the old player, all the players did on the Eagles, most of them did, they were wearing throwback jerseys yeah. yesterday of all the former players or j- jerseys of former players from years past. Uh, the, the old tight end, Brad Selleck, who was on the team back in 2008 when they went to the NFC Championship game and lost to the Cardinals, he wore a Carmichael jersey. Um, I think uh, Jason Peters was wearing a Dawkins jersey who just got inducted into the Hall of Fame or got nominated for the Hall of Fame. And then... Um, who else? Uh, someone was wearing, I think it was Fletcher Cox. He was wearing a Reggie White jersey. So yeah, a, lot, a lot of the Eagles that were up there on the on the stage yesterday were also wearing throwback jerseys of uh, Eagles players and from years and decades past. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, you know, why you know after the Eagles victory, uh, you know, I had to turn my eyes to the sky, of course, uh, because this was a big week in space as well. We saw the launch of the Falcon Heavy. Right, uh, which is now officially the most powerful rocket on the planet. Um, it went off almost without a hitch. Right, it had three stages um, of you know basically uses the Falcon rocket um, that has been used to launch um, the the Dragon modules up to the space station and things like this. And um, it was, this is part of the system that they're looking at for kind of uh, both further moon exploration and potentially they're still working on what, which direction they're going to go um, either with the Falcon heavy or with uh, um, the BFR they're calling it. Suppose the big fucking rocket is basically <laughs> the one they're developing is called, although for public consumption, they call it the big Falcon rocket. Um, but one of those was eventually going to move to going to take us to Mars. Um, so uh, what was what was remarkable for me is that, you know, I grew up, you know, I was born like, you know, right after the um, uh, uh, the moon landing. Right. So I was born in 69. And, you know, I always remember seeing that those pictures of NASA and the rocket launches and things like this and all these people cheering and all these people watching this stuff. Um, and, you know, I've, I've always carried that with me. And what was remarkable about this about the SpaceX launch was um, the Falcon Heavy was that um 
there were tons and tons of people there. Um, the people that tuned in and watched this stuff apparently, you know, were kind of like the most launch, uh, most watched um, rocket launch in ages. Um, and, you know, SpaceX had, you know, so they have about 6,000 employees and they had like everything was packed. And I watched the SpaceX live stream for it. So you got to see inside the company, people just going absolutely nuts. Um, watch it come off. So the, they they successfully landed. You know, so the one go, that goes out went out. You know, the rocket goes up. That went off without hitch. They um, successfully uh, landed two of the, the original boosters on the side. The side boosters they came down and landed perfectly. The third one, which is on the main stuff, which they had to do some modifications and stuff in order for the Falcon Heavy, um, that missed the um, the landing on the drone ship out the sea. Um, something happened and kind of was coming back. So that's one of the things they're going to work on. But my, you know, two out of three ain't bad um, in terms of coming back. And what made the big news is the, the people didn't know if this was hype or if this was for real. And it turns out it was for real is that um, so in order to kind of figure out payload stuff in order to put that they have a I forget exactly the terminology for it. But basically they want to put in like a mass simulator. So something that will actually simulate the amount of mass that you want in. So part of the reason why they wanted to go to this Falcon Heavy was they wanted to be able to launch larger satellites, right? Much more significant and, sat- and, and substantial satellites. Um, SpaceX did that is. And so they start setting this stuff up. So what do they have to do is simulate. The, the weight of that so elon musk what does he do he decides okay what we're going to do he's going to send his red tesla rover right um into space with a mannequin dressed in a spacex suit right hand one hand on the steering wheel one hand on on the side of the car with a with a sign that's coming up where the radio would be that says don't panic right and then put rigged it up with cameras to circle around the earth and stuff like this so then you got to be treated to um the tesla roadster with starman they call them starman circulating the planet with images of this car right um circulating with the earth in the back watching the sun come up and down um it was just it was i mean it was something else my kids and i watched it together um and so anyways, but, you know, they find out that, that they actually overshot. They, they put used too much thrust on this. So originally it was supposed to go up and orbit around Mars, then back around the sun for like potentially a million years. Right. Um, and but they used too much boost. So it's actually going to slightly miss Mars <laughs> and it's going to head towards the asteroid belt. It's going to come close to the orbit of Ceres, which is kind of like a planetoid that's out in the in, in the asteroid belt. And um and, you know, so potentially we could be treated to watching the Tesla Roadster getting pelted <laughs> right, and destroyed by asteroids right, in the not too distant future. So, um, yeah, so that was that was something else. I mean, uh, the thing is, is that what I the next day I was immediately kind of like going on the news and stuff and um, went back and reread this piece that came out in Jacobin um, not too long ago, a couple of years back, actually, by Nick Levine. Um, it was called it was basically about democratizing space. And um, I was just kind of reminded say, yep, this is exactly the stuff that I've been arguing for for j- kind of long, just as long, if not longer, that Nick Levine has been is basically saying that we are on the precipice of having uh, the, the launch of, you know, what I was been calling galactic capitalism. He just basically says, look, this is going to happen, happen about the private privatization of space has been um, has been unleashed right now. And I think that so on the one hand, we might a lot of us who are interested in this stuff might look at this and see this as wow this has got like an awe and it was kind of an awe-inspiring specter i thought at least um but on the other hand uh, we're going to see the launch of something and there's a lot of investors and the business news and things like this are now kind of like drooling and they're, you know drooling basically over the prospects of uh, of like privatizing space so um you know it's, it's going to have an impact on terms of where resources are put um, and also, since the model is, um, you know, on the one hand, look all awe and all amazing stuff. Let's see what we can accomplish up there in the skies. Well, meanwhile, uh, as you know, Sean brought to, you know, came back as we we're getting ready for the shows, looking at um, what Elon Musk uh, kind of is like as offering his employees at Tesla who are attempting to unionize is uh, roller coasters and yogurt. Right, Sean? <laughs> yep. <laughs> So that's our future, folks. We've got uh, pretty pictures from space and uh, yogurt and roller coasters, uh, like where we work. How about that? <laughs> yep. I mean, I, I think having frozen yogurt and, of course, it has to be frozen. It can't be ice cream. Right. But frozen yogurt and a roller coaster is better than having a union at work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, then you always got, you know, something with a little protein in it, right? You know, you don't need to pay yeah. your bills and stuff. <laughs> So, you know, this is that, you know, again, if I ever had, you know, I, I always kind of measure my own commitments to stuff, you know, because we're highly critical of, 
people putting too much investment in, you know, certain politicians. We saw this with Obama and that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I think my 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 trap, my personal trapping has always been like, you know, you want someone like Elon Musk. Right. You know, it's just like I have that little bit of craving just like you can't you just be a good person? <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, I mean, can't you just do the right thing? And, you know, the answer is almost always no. Right. So like on the one hand, he's doing all this kind of crazy, cool stuff. On the other hand, it's like, you know, it's the same thing with all these freaking like, you know, Silicon Valley billionaires is that the model is you invest in this kind of like high, like, you know, highly skilled professional class folks. You do amazing things. You push your workforce to the bone. Right. But then for the workers who are actually doing the assembly and doing the stuff down the road is that you go you go in your anti-union efforts. And it's like, Jesus Christ, it's like you've got enough money. Right. This does not have to have to be this way. And it comes down to the fact the more they accumulate money. Right. And it's about power. It's about control. It's wanting no nobody to stand in your way of kind of accomplishing your mission. You know, and that's that kind of like, you know, ultra libertarian future that these folks want. And, you know, um, and that's what they're projecting into space, which is why I'm paying attention to it. So anyways. So that's that. So, Sean, uh, so uh, before we get into beer news, I have to I have to have a, a, a little bit of thing. I didn't put this on the notes, right, um, because I, I just wanted just to, to do the big reveal um, with you, buddy, um, is that look what came in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Trumpy it bear. Real. It exists. It exists. I have my official uh, Trumpy bear certificate of authenticity. Right. He does indeed have a little zipper in the pocket in the back that unveils nothing less than the great American flag. So you're going to take that to the military parade when it happens. <laughs> so I've got the Trumpy bear. It's real, everybody. Trumpy bear is in my possession. So so uh, what my idea here is now is so Trumpy Bear is going to go a little bit on a journey of discovery, okay? Trumpy Bear is going to be um, having to start to kind of, you know, come to some critical consciousness over the next kind of several months and stuff. So he's going to be comment commenting on it. He's going to be a character. And I think that uh, if you want to follow Trumpy Bear, the exploits of Trumpy Bear, um, the raging chicken Trumpy Bear, that is, um, I hate to say it, but that's going to be a members only thing. So uh, we're gonna, every once in a while, I'll put some teasers out there with some of the pictures out there. But Trumpy Bear is going to have um, a whole story unfold right on a members only site. And you can become a member, right, by going to patreon.com slash rc press right any membership level doesn't matter you'll get access to the exploits of trumpy bear coming up um it should be fun uh should be kind of a cool little thing that we're going to add in here um and then it, 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 assuming trumpy bear sticks around for a while right not just our trumpy bear but the actual thing trumpy bear out there um there might be opportunities to get your very own trumpy bear um um at, through through raging chicken so we'll see so that's my big reveal sh- for today sean i had i had to wait for for the end uh to, to, to kind of like you know take him out of the box man and show you <laughs> nice <laughs> crazy so hey what's happening uh beer wise out your way i mean i know you've been off for a little bit because you've been doing this parading and all this stuff <laughs> um monday pizza boys gonna be canning their turkey burglar berliner vice Ooh, nice. Three and a half percent sour, German sour, half of bison, which is really good. That's awesome. That's awesome. Awesome. Is there, I, hey, are they doing anything for Pizza Boy for Mardi Gras? I don't think so. Really? Just, I just, like, I got some Mardi Gras stuff I'll report on. Go look on here. But, um, so, uh, so what's it called again? I'm sorry. Turkey Burglar. Turkey Burglar. Berliner Weiss. Nice. This coming up. Well, I have to say first, I want to give a shout out. I'm going to link. I'm going to link to this um, um, to this brewery. I've mentioned them. It's been a while since I mentioned them. This is uh, Woodland Farm Brewery, uh, brewery, and this is up in Utica, New York, or technically Marcy, New York. Um, and uh, I, I've always described it as like you know a short bike ride from where I grew up. And um, they've just been doing some amazing stuff. I love the beer that they they have on tap up there. I've got a couple growlers. Uh, you know, I'll go anytime I go back up to Utica, I'll stop up there and uh, and fill up some growlers and and have this stuff. I love their beer. Um, the people are just great. I've, I've talked with them multiple times, and uh, they're just really cool. So when I went there in uh, the summer of 2016, um, they had just uh, bottled their first like like you know you know bomber bottles, right? And ones that you had to age. So basically they were selling them, not it's that you actually had to age them yourself, right? So I said, yeah, hold on to it for, you want to hold on to this for maybe like, you know, six to eight months is probably what you want to do. 
And Sean has always kind of counseled me on this and stuff. Yeah, you know, it keeps on aging, right? The longer it stays in the bottle. So, you know, hold on to some stuff. And I remember early on when uh, when you were working at Pizza Boy, you'd always say, like, yeah, you know, buy a couple bottles and keep, you know, you could have one now or in a little bit and then save one for a year or so and see what it, so- see what it tastes like. Um, so I've been saving this one. And this was uh, this one is called Oak LB Lives. Um, they had first produced their bottles of this, this L, the LB Lives, and this is Oak LB Lives. Um, this was an English barley, barley wine that was um, kind of like aged for a bit in oak barrels. Um, comes in about 9.7% alcohol ABV, um, and it was bottled on August 9th, 2016. And so I opened this last night. Um, this week has just been kind of crazy. So I'm like, I save this. I say this, like, you know, I'm going to wait until the end of this week, and I'm going to open that bottle. And it was so good. I was blown away. I haven't had a beer that good in a long time. Um, it, it was it was smoky, but not too smoky. It had, if anybody's familiar with the whiskey Lafreg, right? That has like that peat smoke. That's the kind of smoke that was in this, right? It was that this this peat smokiness to it. It was super smooth. I thought it was going to have a much more bite to it, especially coming in at nine point seven. Um, it was so good. So, man, I'm telling you, if you're ever going up the Adirondacks, um, the Woodland Farm Brewery is right off Route 12. It's right on your way. I mean, if you're coming up from this state, you're going you're gonna to go up Route 12. You know, say you, you take 81 to Syracuse, uh, you, and you're not going to go straight on, on 81, but if actually you, you go New York State through Raid to the Utica exit, and you go Route 12 right into Old Forge, that area, um, the Chain of Lakes, um, that area, stop by Woodland Farm Brewery um, for their stuff and tell them Raging Chicken sent you. Because, man, I'm telling you, this was great. So... Um, that was my big, big surprise of the week was the the Woodland Farm Brewery bottle. So, and I have to thank you for always saying to me, "Hey, save those bottles and let them sit for a bit." <laughs> so, just nice. another. What's that? No, I was gonna say, nice. Glad you enjoyed it. And glad it aged well. Oh my God, it was. I it, I, I had one of the other ones right because I bought like I think three or four of their bottles at that point, and I opened another one not too long ago, and it was good. Right, it was really good, but you, you know, it was kind of wasn't didn't knock my socks off right i mean it was i would definitely put it in like a you know upper class of beers there's no doubt about it but this one wow that was great Uh, i wish i bought more you know now i wish i was like you know i screwed up by not getting more but whatever um well a couple other quick announcements for everybody um you know i always like to do the rundown here uh free will um has got its schedule this week right and now they're kind of making their transition from their um, their huge super bowl party from last weekend um now the you know the winter olympics is is off and running and uh mike pence is sitting with the folks from north korea who the hell knows what's going on there right Uh, for the opening ceremonies that'll be all interesting um, but so free will, um, starting tonight, um, they're gonna have the flying pie guy and beer flying pie guy. You should be clear. It's not just a sweet pie, but you also get those neat meat pies and things like this. I'm actually thinking about going and grabbing a couple tonight. Um, on Saturday, you'll have tray locally sourced, um, uh, with again with beer, the, the food truck will be tray locally sourced. And then on Sunday, they'll have the brew Asana beer and yoga, right? At 10 30. Um, you gotta, you gotta, Go to their website or go to their Facebook page to kind of uh, reserve your spot. And then Down to Earth Cafe will be providing, providing the food once again. So if you're in the area, in the Perkesee area, go um, check out them out on Sunday. Um, they're also having um, for Mardi Gras, in celebration of Mardi Gras, it's not going to be right on that night, but it's the Saturday following it. Or I'm sorry, the Sunday following on the 18th from 12 to 5 is that they are going to have a um, bourbon barrel tap takeover um in basically in honor of you know bourbon street and things like this um they were going to have uh ralphius trinity fight is going to be on you're going to have um uh, a belgian triple let me run down there's going to be a belgian triple um, barrel age there's going to be the special cookie which is a rem barrel, barrel age one the special imperial spice brown ale um ella which is kind of like the twin to ralphius will be on brown beard rum barrel age bone saw pinot, pinot noir barrel age barley wine uh, which is really good which I like that one in a Baltic Porter. Um, so if you're looking to celebrate Mardi Gras the, the weekend after, um, that'll all be happening uh, February 18th at Free Will. And of course, Saucony Creek out in Kutztown is also doing its own Mardi Gras thing on February 13th, Tuesday, Fat Tuesday. Uh, you can head out to Saucony, Breek, uh, Saucony Creek Brewery, um, get some awesome food um, and drink some awesome beer. So that's my rundown for the week. So anything nice. else? anything else for the good of the order, Sean? No, nothing right now. Just looking to get the hell out of here, huh? 
Yeah, get some rest. <laughs> he does look tough. I have to say, Sean, you, you've uh, you, you, you've done a bang up job. They've kind of uh, given how like exhausted you are, not feeling well you are, and actually driven in driven in from Philadelphia this morning. So kudos to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Uh, look for us online. I should say, too, as well, we're going to have additional interviews. You'll see if you've been following the podcast um, on Podbean. We've been releasing some of the interviews um, that we've been doing through uh, – we did at Keystone Progress Summit. Um, we're going to look for over the weekend, uh, maybe even later today, depending on what my time looks like. We're also going to get that full interview from Crystal Ball um, – not interview. You're going to get the full speech that Crystal Ball gave as part of the keynote. You're going to get um, Chris Rabb's speech, Representative Chris Rabb's speech, and all also, Larry Krasner, who, by the way, thanks to Sean Kitchen. Sean Kitchen got the image and he posted it up. Sean Kitchen took that image. Sean Kitchen took that image. Sean Kitchen took that image. Not me. I didn't mean to take any credit from Sean Kitchen. Sean Kitchen gets a little testy about this kind of stuff. Sean Kitchen took that image. Um, got the picture of Larry Krasner donning a Raging Chicken Press pin. Like, that was a moment, Sean. Thank you. <laughs> awesome all right this is kevin mahoney and sean kitchen took that image sean kitchen um live sort of <laughs> coming to you once again for out to Coop podcast uh we will see you uh throughout the week and into next week if not very last we'll see you next week back right here raging chicken press out to Coop podcast it's been quite a week it's always quite a week these days folks but uh we look forward you know talking more with you digging in bringing the fight Movement Media, folks. See ya! So we've got to throw out this conventional wisdom. We've got to throw out the old models that we know aren't working. And not just in 2016. How many state houses seats did we lose? Thousand. Governor's mansions. The House. The Senate. And we keep running the same model where we think that money is everything. And we think that connections to Wall Street and Silicon Valley and D.C. are everything. And then we step back and we say, but they think we're out of touch. What happened? Why do they think we're elitists? What happened?